Mr. Lockery, could you confirm if you can hear us from the chambers? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Colleagues, we'd like to see who's in attendance. If you don't mind, we have uh, four in council chambers. If you don't mind just putting your video on, I'd be grateful. Present, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Salee? Present. Thanks. We will start in just a moment, colleagues. So here we are. Welcome, uh, colleagues, to the <clears throat> fifth meeting of the Strategic Priorities and Policy Committee. Uh, this uh, virtual meeting is held during the COVID-19 emergency, and we would ask the public to check the city website for current details of COVID-19 service impacts. Mes members' meetings can be viewed via live streaming on YouTube and the city website. I'd like to say as well, the City of London is committed to making every effort to provide alternate formats and communication supports for council standing or advisory committee meetings and information upon request. To make a request for any city service, please contact accessibility at london.ca or 519-661-2489, extension 2425. To make a request specific to this meeting, please contact sppc at london.ca. I'll uh, look for any disclosures of pecuniary interest. Councillor Helmer. Thank you. On the uh, report relating to River Road, I declare a pecuniary interest as my father is employed by the National Golf Course Owners Association, and the decision would affect the membership fees that the City of London pays to that organization. So noted. Thanks very much. Any other declarations? Seeing none. Colleagues, we have no items on the consent agenda and one specific scheduled item, uh, which includes a public participation meeting on the item related to golf. With regard to that, I'll look for a motion. Well, actually, I think what we will do is we will start first. This is, we, we can be a little more uh, casual about this. We'll start first with a report from uh, Mr. Stafford, a brief overview of the report. Then it would be my plan for us to go into uh, public participation where we have uh, some individuals who have 
indicated their interest uh, in uh, providing some feedback to us. After we close the uh, public participation meeting, then we will uh, ask the committee if they have questions uh, with regard to uh, uh, anything from staff and then determine uh, what appropriate uh, next steps are with respect to consideration of any motion or any such things accordingly. So if you're not uncomfortable with that, what I would like to do is uh, ask Mr. Stafford to provide a brief overview uh, of his report, please. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you through the chair. Um, the report today has brought forward, and I'll just give a little bit of background first, is uh, the report, we brought a report back to SPPC in February of last year, uh, presenting findings and recommendations from the review undertaken by KPMG for the service delivery of municipal golf. On February 11th, council resolved that the KPMG report be received for information. The second part was directing a report back at a public participation meeting to the appropriate standing committee. That's what brings us here today. And that was to discuss with respect to the option set out in option one. Uh, civic administration at that time was also directed to take no further action on option, options two, three, and four. All of those options were based around the golf courses in the municipal system. So option one was to come back with a report on the river road decision. Uh, that's why we're here today. And the purpose is to respond to that. So that's uh, where we stand. Uh, we recognize the item in front today is a difficult one. It's difficult for us, it's difficult for the community and it's difficult for council. But the conversation today is required for the future health of London's municipal golf system. The report is part of the larger corporate service process review that began in 2018 and administration's report back on River Road that was requested from council. Um, we'd like to take the opportunity to thank the members of the golf community. They have provided a lot of letters to the committee today. So uh, it, was, uh, it was appreciated that they, uh, they took that uh, advice and, and expressed their opinions. Uh, I'd also like to thank the golf staff that uh, worked in 2020. It was a difficult year during the COVID restrictions. Uh, we were one of the first services to open. Uh, we learned a lot as we went, but we provided a very safe golfing opportunity for Londoners. The recommendation that we have in front of you today from the report is a recommendation by civic administration to see, cease golf operations at the municipally operated River Road Golf Course. This will mitigate pressures on the budget and pressures on the golf system going forward. We also recommend and direct, ask for direction to initiate the disposition of property process in compliance with the city's sale and other disposition of land policy. And then notwithstanding the council's approved sale of major assets policy, we recommend that any partial or full disposition of River Road Golf Course lands be allocated to the Municipal Golf Reserve Fund to help sustain the golf system going forward. What I would like to do as well is address some of the questions and themes that came forward in the letters that we received and putting them into a, a few brief uh, synopsis really, just to give a brief overview. I realized there were a number of letters and uh, uh, they didn't all be covered in this synopsis that I'm going to have, but I did, uh, I did read all the letters and take into account all of the suggestions and uh, comments that were in the list. One of the things that came up uh, pretty regularly was booking times. And I just wanted to, uh, to let you know that we will be, and we've learned from last year in the COVID that we're able to reduce the booking times back to more of a normal state. We started the year off at 12 minute tee time intervals in order to uh, allow us to better manage the, the traffic flow around the clubhouse. Certainly not on the course in particular. Uh, there's a lot of space to, uh, to be able to handle things out on the golf course, but really around the clubhouse and around the booking and around the starting of the system. So we wanted to uh, start that out at 12, uh, be safe. That was one of the golf recommendations throughout the industry. We did reduce those as the year went on and we do intend to reduce those going forward. We also struggle with our booking system. It was a, an older booking system it saw demand and, uh, and pressures that it hasn't seen before. We do have a new booking system ready to go for uh, 2021, and we hope this will alleviate the problems uh, along with the lesser booking times. So that's one of the issues that we talked about. Uh, one of the other things, and it's part of a recommendation, certainly the third recommendation, it's we appreciate that the golfers did contribute money toward the building of River Road and toward the golf season and the heyday of golf. 
Uh, and out of respect for that, we do believe that the proceeds of sale from the River Road Golf Course should go back into the golf reserve system so that it goes back into where the golf reserve, where the golf funds came from, and it goes back in to help sustain the golf system. So that's, uh, we do believe that as well. Um, one of the things uh, was all around trying to attract more golfers uh, to make things uh, better when we weren't in the uh, COVID year. And we'll, we'll try and keep the COVID year out of there, although there will be commentary around that. Uh, we tried many marketing, advertising, uh, promotions. Uh, we do do variable pricing. Some of the questions come up around variable pricing. We do do that. We have uh, three different sets of pricing. We have different membership options. Uh, we have a variety of different ways to, to try and attract and find a, uh, a rate or a, a plan that works for the individual golfers and works for the system as well. So we do look at that. We also have third-party golf, uh, as you may recall, London Golf and Golf Now are also part in order to try and get some of those tee times uh, utilized that are, are in the off times and non-peak times. So we have utilized a, a variety of different ways and methods to, uh, to enhance and, uh, and fill up our golf system. Uh, the other thing that we had, there was uh, some concern around the golf management and, and what we have there. And I just wanted to reassure people on, on that, that we have uh, professional uh, caretakers, greenskeepers that are part of the Ontario Golf Superintendents Association. They look after our golf courses and take great care of those, keep them in great condition. And we also have PGA of Canada professionals that uh, uh, look after each of the shops and uh, that's their trade. They've all worked in uh, different pro shops and different golf courses throughout Ontario. Uh, some of them are quite renowned in their field and uh, we do have that group that is managing the, uh, the system as well as the background support from some of our city managers and chartered accountants and our financial teams. So we do have that support in our management system. I just wanted to address that as well. Uh, the other thing uh, that we have to address is there's been a lot of controversy around the staff that we utilized uh, during the 2020 season. Uh, this staff was redeployed from various management positions throughout the corporation. It was a strategy used throughout the corporation to uh, better utilize the staff that was there for some of their programs and services that were not being made available due to the COVID year. Uh, they were able to be redeployed to various areas throughout the city, golf being one of those. The one thing that I want to rest assured is indeed they were they were paid higher than a casual rate employee that typically works in the golf system. Uh, they replaced approximately $100,000 worth of casual labor uh, during that time, but their wages were covered off in their own service areas and their own business units in the own throughout the corporation. So those higher paid wages uh, were not attributed to the golf system in 2020. I just wanted to make people aware of that. It's a question that comes up quite often. Um, the other thing that comes up is the maintenance and the, and the number and the loss. And I, you know, I saved it to last. It's the last point and I appreciate my time today. Uh, when you see a loss of $315,000, and I know we talked in the spring about River Road losing fifty dollars to $80,000 at the time of year that we were uh, starting to move into that uh, decision. It's still an accurate number. Uh, in, in projections going forward, there was $315,000, but that was used to maintain the asset. And we did that in a variety of areas, whether it be soccer fields, buildings. Uh, Labatt Park, for example, had one exhibition game this year, but we had to maintain the asset. It's expensive turf. Uh, it's turf susceptible to disease and it's turf susceptible to loss if we don't maintain it. Uh, it had to be maintained. That was the amount. If we did open it up for revenue, we don't just open it up with that $315,000. If we, for example, uh, garnered $400,000 worth of revenue, revenue does not outpace expenses at River Road. And it wasn't any different this year. I know people think it would be with the larger tee times, the greater staff that we needed, the COVID precautions, the one person per cart, all of those things, the revenue still would not have outpaced expenses. We would have anticipated on a $400,000 revenue that we would have had 760 some odd thousand in expenses. It still would have been 50 to $80,000 more than we would have anticipated by not opening it up. I know it's hard to see that $315,000 number, but that's how it states, that's how it works. You can't bring in revenue without bringing in additional staff that was very short staffed, 
limited supplies, trying to keep those greens and fairways alive and disease free. And that's why it was used. So thank you for your time today. I appreciate that uh, bit of a preamble. Those were some of the main questions that were proactively uh, brought forward. And I just wanted to address some of those in a proactive way. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. We, uh, we extended uh, your time because I thought uh, with the great public interest in this that it would be appropriate uh, to hear what you have to say. Colleagues, we're going to uh, open up the public participation meeting right now. So I'll look for a motion to do that, please. Councillor Lewis, seconded by Councillor Lehman. Um, can we call the vote? I vote yay, Mr. Chair. So noted, thank you. I vote yay. Closing the vote, the motion's passed 13 to zero with one recused. Thanks very much, colleagues. So what you will uh, see are a number of communications are in our package, and we will acknowledge all of those uh, as part of a motion going forward. But I do have two individuals who have specifically requested uh, to speak uh, to um, to uh, this particular issue. I'll call on them in just a moment, but I, again, the ground rules, as we always have, it's five minutes uh, maximum uh, to speak. And we'd ask you to give us your name and if you're comfortable, your address. And why don't we, uh, with that understanding, uh, we will start with uh, Mr. Andy McGuigan. Mr. McGuigan, are you there? So this is by telephone. So Mr. McGuigan, are you there? He'll be unmuting. We'll get him uh, online in just a moment. Well, we are trying to get uh, Mr. McGuigan uh, hooked in. Uh, we do have a second. Uh, a uh, person who wishes to speak at the PPM, uh, Mr. Craig uh, uh, Lockery, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Mr. Lockery, why don't we start with you, if that's all right, you have five minutes. We'd ask you please to more formally introduce yourself, your address, and uh, we'll do five minutes as soon as you start. Thanks very much. My name is Craig Lockery. I'm the Director of Golf Services from Golf Ontario. And um, my address is, uh, I'll give you my email address. It's C-L-O-U-G-H-R-Y at G-A-O dot C-A. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Again, um, you know, from Golf Ontario, we're the provincial sport organization for golf in Ontario. It was appointed by the provincial government. We've been around since 1923 and we serve the game of golf uh, in Ontario through our championships, our grow the game initiatives in terms of participation with our sport development department um, and programs like golf in schools, learn to play. Um, and we provide these programs through government grants, partnerships, and through the 750 golf facilities across the province. Um, I'm gonna take you on a little journey here through uh, talk about the economic impact of golf, participation, the health benefits, and then I'm going to get specifically to the city courses, in particular River Road. So uh, the economic impact of golf in Ontario, golf contributes an annual spend of over $6 billion, that's a B, in Ontario. Golf has an average spend of $41.4 million per 100,000 people. That's over $165 million in London alone. And the London area, you should know, 
is home to the second largest region of golf per capita in Ontario. It's clear Londoners love their golf. In terms of government tax revenue, golf is an 810 million tax contributor provincially. That's 1.7 billion if you include federal taxes as well. Golf is by far and away the largest participation sport in Ontario. There are approximately 1.7 million golfers in Ontario, and there are approximately 20 million rounds of golf played annually. And rounds played in 2020, as Scott had mentioned earlier, were up 22.9% uh, versus 2019. The increase was impressive when you consider that we only opened May 16th. We're missing about six weeks of our season last year. The number of new golfers and those who tried the game for the first time went up in 2020. This is a huge opportunity. And 85% of all golf facilities across Ontario are actually open to the public. The game is very accessible. The health benefits of golf, a recent study showed that golfers on average live five years longer than non-golfers. It's also proven that golf relieves the stresses of everyday life and is excellent for your mental and physical well-being. The 2020 part golf participation numbers don't lie. This was one of the most important outlets for people and communities. And in all indications, we're headed to a very similar year coming in 2021. If this is solely a budget decision, then I would question, do you look at other recreational sports? And it just comes back. I'm sorry? No, please go ahead. Okay. No, there we are. Could I ask if there's somebody else on the phones, please, to mute your, uh, to mute your phones, if you would, please, while our speaker goes ahead? Thank you. Mr. Lockery, could you um, unmute yourself? I'm sorry, I muted you. That's okay, thank you. Go ahead again, please. Yep. If this is solely a budget decision, then I would question, do you look at other recreational sport activities the city is involved with with the same lens? Do you evaluate hockey arenas, ballparks, soccer pitches, tennis courts, and the like with the same scrutiny as you would with okay. River Road Golf right. Course? Please go ahead. Mr. Lockery, please go ahead. Mr. Lockery. No. Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Thank you. No problem. I would ask that, you know, if you look at other sports and recreational activities and they have to break even on your budget, do you consider them in their current state? Or are golf courses simply a part of your overall recreational strategy? Because if you look at the land, look at those other sporting activities through the same lens, then they should all have to break even. Otherwise, you should divest yourself of those properties too. My ask is this, that the council make a motion to evaluate and do a deep dive into the property use at River Road and how it's currently managed and what other activities can be introduced along with golf, the property to serve more of your community and constituents. For example, we recently worked with the city of Toronto to create an overall strategy for their city of Toronto golf courses. We created snow trails that could be used for cross country skiing and walking by the community during winter months. We did so strategically using areas that would be low impact on the golf course conditions come spring and summer. We're also working with the city of Toronto to create five and 10 kilometer running and walking paths that could be used along with golf in summer and spring and fall. We used a GPS software tool that helped us identify areas at each of their five properties that were not being used by golfers that don't need to be maintained. So you could stop water use and fertilizing thereby saving the city on expenses and labor. There are ways to make your city courses more efficient. In closing, it would be a shame if the usable open green space is lost because all options weren't considered. Golf Ontario is willing to work with you to explore similar solutions to what the city of Toronto has already implemented. We're confident that we can find a prosperous golf green space solution for you. Thank you, Mr. Lockery. We now have, uh, is Mr. McGuigan on the line now? I'll ask the clerk. This is Andy McGuigan. Can you hear me? Mr. McGuigan, yes, please. You have five minutes. Uh, just identify if you would, if you're comfortable with your uh, address, and then uh, we will give you five minutes, please. Go ahead. Yes, 2250 Borough Drive, London. Thank My you. My question for the committee 
is what was the objective of the London City Council when it opened Thames Valley in 1924, Fanshawe in 1958, and River Road in 1992? I would suggest that in addition to many other health and social issues, the additions were related to the growth of the city population that required recreational facilities just as it does today. The city in his wisdom foresaw the need for a facility to accommodate a non-contact sport other than hockey, football, baseball, etc., which was multi-generational, non-discriminatory, based on age, color, or creed, and an alternative to the private clubs, and that's still applicable to today. From a health point of view, golf was an excellent choice for all ages. <clears throat> And with the innovation of golf carts, extends the play of life of many seniors with some disabilities. It also encourages cross-cultural socialization, perhaps a bigger issue today. Financially, it was viewed as a less costly alternative for the less of affluent taxpayers, where a private club was a stretch, but desired, but and those who desired an outdoor activity that would be played with family parent and child, husband and wife, friends and neighbors. Finally, I'd like to state that golf is the fastest growing sport in the world as witnessed by the LPGA, the European and Asian golf and projected to continue. Our golf course courses are in fact a city asset that deserves better management as opposed to being reviewed as a liability does not need to be a financial drain on the city. The real issue should be the health and welfare of our citizens as it was in 1924, 1958, and 1992. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGuigan. Now, those are the two formal uh, uh, requests we've had to speak uh, today, and uh, we will invite as this is a public participation meeting if there is Anyone else who, that's, that is it then, clerk? I'm told that is it. There's, well, because there's no one else on the line. Thank you very much. Therefore, with that, I will look for a motion to close the public participation meeting. Councillor Plows is seconded by. Councillor Van Holst will call the vote. Councillor Lewis? Sorry, Your Worship, I, I'm, I have voted. I just was getting your attention to get my name on the speaker's list. That's fine. Closing the vote, the motion's passed 13 to 0 with one recuse. Thanks very much. Again, I'd like to thank our two participants in the public participation meeting for your contributions. That uh, is helpful. Uh, colleagues, we will open this up uh, in a moment for questions to... I think initially to uh, Mr. Stafford and, uh, and, uh, and staff. But first, I'd like to ask a couple of questions as it relates to, uh, to you, Mr. Staff, if I can, relating to some of the comments that we heard. Uh, and maybe you can just help clarify. Uh, the question, I believe, from Mr. Lockery was, is this a budget decision? And in terms of evaluating golf, do you evaluate other sports the same way? in terms of profit loss. I wonder if you might be able to respond to that query. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, it is a different, uh, a different system. So uh, the philosophy of, of golf, and uh, certainly long before I, I got involved in the golf system, uh, was that it was a self-sustaining system. So uh, that's where golf lies. Uh, other amenities and uh, parks and recreation amenities that we have do uh, uh, do receive, they're part of an expense and revenue does not match expense. Uh, and they operate that way for sure. But golf has been in a self-sustaining uh, philosophy. Thank you. Another uh, question that uh, came up as a result of our participants 
in uh, wondering if there had been a deep dive uh, uh, into River Road and considered other options. And I believe that was golf uh, in conjunction with other types of, of health related uh, practices, be it walking, ski trails and the like. And I wonder if that consideration has, uh, has come into your analysis uh, through you, Mr. Stafford. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Uh, all of our golf properties uh, certainly get utilized for uh, in the off season for walking dogs and uh, uh, walking people, uh, cross country skiing, uh, sledding, uh, a variety of different things uh, occur in the off seasons in the winter and, and certainly with the snow we've had over the past, uh, past few weeks. Um, those are activities that are provided at no charge to the public. Uh, those are activities that have been going on for quite some time at, uh, at the golf courses and in a variety of our other parks as well. So uh, we, we have looked at uh, other options, but when we get to the situation here that we're in tonight, uh, it's a situation and it is a financial exercise and it is about, about what we have to uh, in our capital plan and what our shortfall is and, and what revenues we do need to support the, the overall golf system going forward. So we have looked at those items, but uh, but this is indeed a financial exercise. Thanks very much. I'm going to start the speakers list uh, with uh, Councillor Lewis. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, you you actually touched on a, at least one of the questions I had written down uh, already, but I'm going to uh, perhaps expand on that a little bit uh, if Mr. Stafford, uh, through you, could uh, respond. Uh, just for clarification, uh, although golf is uh, evaluated under a golf pace for a golf system, uh, and I think you touched on this, Mr. Stafford, but is it not accurate to say that we uh, conduct the assessment of the level of assets we have uh, across all of recreation? Uh, for example, uh, I know in the hockey community, uh, we no longer use Silverwoods Arena. It, it was deemed not to be viable and, and not to have a demand there. Uh, so is that asset calculation conducted across the board on all of our assets. Mr. Stafford. Uh, yes, through the chair, certainly all of our assets that we have are, are looked at in uh, life cycle renewal and, and looked at uh, demand and looked at uh, what they can provide to the community. And, and as you, you mentioned, Glencairn Arena and Silverwoods Arena are two, uh, two good examples of, of taking a, an asset out of the inventory or, or utilizing it in a different way. Councillor Lewis. So I have two other questions here and then I'll yield to, to see what colleagues have to say. Uh, certainly uh, no one questions the value. We heard about the, the health benefits and, and uh, the exercise benefits. No one questions the value of outdoor recreation having a benefit. Uh, but through you to our staff, uh, Chair, uh, my understanding is uh, even if we divest ourselves of River Road as an asset, we will still have, uh, I believe it's 70 uh, two holes of golf uh, in the municipal inventory that golfers can enjoy. Um, how does that compare uh, to other municipalities, uh, you know, understanding that we're comparing slightly different populations and whatnot, but to comparable municipalities, are we at 72 holes uh, left uh, comparable? Are we underserviced? Are we overserviced? What does that look like? Mr. Stafford. Uh, through the chair, we, we would have a, a very substantial municipal golf system, uh, one that we'd still be very proud of and, and move forward with, uh, with the exception of Toronto as the KPMG report uh, focuses. Toronto has more, uh, certainly a, a more substantial population than we have. But uh, with our competitors, Hamilton has three golf courses uh, at this point in time. And uh, as you look across the country, uh, we would still have a very substantial municipal golf system. Councillors. Uh, thank you. So final question uh, for now, at least. Uh, and again, this was touched on, uh, but I'm just wondering if we could get a little bit of expansion uh, because you had mentioned that there was, you know, some efforts at marketing and, and different uh, time of day pricing and that kind of thing. Uh, but my understanding is that for the municipal golf service, it's not a level playing field with uh, and this is rather unique to golf uh, in terms of our recreational services uh, where we're actually competing with the private sector. Uh, but my understanding is that it's not the same playing field, um, private versus public golf course management. Uh, there are labor costs, procurement costs, uh, or procurement policies that have to be followed, things like that. 
I'm wondering through you, Mr. Chair, if Mr. Stafford can just um, perhaps enlighten or, or expand on a little bit on what he was uh, touching on in terms of what the challenges are for a public course uh, when we're competing against a private sector that has a different playing field uh, involved. Mr. Stafford. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question. I appreciate the question. It's uh, there are a variety of different models in the private world. Uh, certainly, with uh, from you know owner operated to uh, uh, very elite, um, they have their own uh, ways of managing and marketing. Some are uh, starting to combine courses. Uh, some are working together as as uh, as partners in in representing the golf industry and, and representing the golf product. Um, you know, as a city, it's, it's one of those things we have to represent ourselves as a, as a member and representation of the Corporation of City of London. So uh, we need to provide a solid product. We need to provide a, a very uh, high standard product as far as uh, safety and initiatives. And I don't want to say that any others aren't. So I, I, I really don't want to say how the others operate. Um, Level playing field or not, I think you know they they may uh, they may question that as well. Whether some of our locations, it's hard to beat uh, you know the center of the city location with the Thames Valley Golf Course. So so some of them compete with that. It's certainly different wage models and different uh, uh, different models of operation uh, that people use. Uh, as you mentioned, different procurement policies. Certainly, if you're a, a private owner operator. Uh, your your own your current policy, uh, so it's 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 different that way. But uh, it, it's I haven't done a complete analysis of the other golf courses in the private world, and they're not as ready to open up their books and show me what they're doing. So uh, it's uh, it's hard for me to uh, address that thoroughly. I'm afraid. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. The Councilor Squire. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Stafford, through the chair to you, um, I, I understand policy, I understand bylaws, um, but I'm trying to figure out why I would be bound or the council would be bound by what you call a philosophy. So w can you help me out? Who is this philosophy? Was it generated at a meeting of council? Was it a generated by uh, bylaw? How, how w was it decided that golf would be uh, a recreational activity that would have to pay for itself as opposed to a lot of other industries? Because this is a very common question that we're, we're being asked as counselors. Why, why the different standard for golf than, uh, than others? So you, if you could help me with this idea of who generated the philosophy, that would be helpful. Mr. Stafford. Yeah, I, thank you and through the chair for that question. I, I looked at the history. Um, looked at the philosophy it's been a long-term philosophy and it and some of it dates back to the original development of uh, the thames valley golf course back in the 1920s and there was some pride of ownership and pride of members uh, and golfers uh, creating the facility on on their dollars on their revenue um, and it's a philosophy and I, I do say that because i looked into policy uh, but it is a philosophy that's been around for uh, a long time uh, long before myself and uh, it, it's one that's uh, I've been carried on uh, for many years throughout the councils. Mr. Squire, Councilor Squire. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the review of, of golf courses in particular and their operating budgets as part of the service review, um, it seems to me, and perhaps I'm wrong, that the, the, this is the, the, for a great period of time, the operating uh, balance or the operating uh, situation of golf courses was in the positive. So how did golf courses end up as something you are going to review from an operating point of view? Is that part of, again, that philosophy of golf that because it was hit a point where it was losing a little bit of money that it would be reevaluated for uh, continuation? Because quite frankly, I don't see that it's a big number to come out of that $4 million when you look at the loss that golf is suffering. Mr. Stafford. Thank you, and through the chair, uh, the reason it was brought forward as, as part of the service review was, was not so much the operating, and I, I appreciate your, uh, your comments on the operating. It was, it was the long-term capital deficit that we had to fund. And the way that the capital deficits or the capital projects get funded in golf is through the revenue that's received. So the additional revenue or, uh, it's, or profit 
uh, that's received in an annual year uh, moves into the golf reserve fund. And we utilize that golf reserve fund to make capital improvements. And that's the only funding source that we have. So that was where the pressure point came. It was the, the deficit as, as pointed out in the corporate asset management plan and where we see ourselves needing to be over the next 10 years with capital uh, life cycle renewals. And that doesn't even reflect the, uh, the capital needs that are on the golf course itself. That's the buildings that we see in the capital asset management plan. So the golf course itself from pumps to irrigations to uh, you know, even the greens themselves, uh, if they need a, a repair or a, a full blown uh, replacement, uh, those aren't covered in that cost. So that's where it became the tipping point, I believe, as we used in the report. And that's where the, uh, it needed to come forward as part of the service review, because as we get to those capital needs going forward, those could place pressure on the, uh, the following multi-year budget that we'd be requesting uh, funds to help support those capital needs. Councillor Scott. Thank you, that's helpful. The final question I have is, um, when you're considering a sale of the property, are you considering a sale for any purpose or for golf, or is it just the highest bidder gets the property and can do within the limitations of our planning procedures, they can do with the land as they're, they're permitted to do. In other words, are there gonna be any restrictions you can contemplate on the sale? Because it seems to me that a lot of people are saying this thing could be a goal. And I guess the proof of that would be, well, would someone buy it to make it a goal? I mean, would, would that happen or not? Mr. Stafford. Thank you, and through the chair, and I, I may hand this over to uh, Ms. Barbone if I, uh, but I'll give a, a quick brief. Uh, our recommendation was through the disposition and property process and compliance with the city's sale and uh, other disposition of land policy. So it, it becomes, a, when the decision uh, tonight, wherever, if it goes that direction, it, it becomes in the hands of realty and through our other policies and in, in the disposition of that land. I will hand it over to Anne. Ms. Barbone, if there's something else you'd like to add to that. Ms. Barbone, you go ahead, please. Thank you, through the chairs. So um, certainly through um, the realty area, we would look to divest the property if that is the direction of council. Um, certainly there are many options that council could consider. However, um, certainly operating it as a golf course is one of them. There are other alternatives, but uh, we haven't done a full evaluation. That would be one of the processes the uh, realty department would begin to um, look at should council wish to go that route but certainly it could continue to be operated as a golf course. Um, we do believe there is significant value in that, noting that a, a, public, a private sector would run it differently than obviously a public sector entity, and they would be subject to different provisions. However, there is uh, zoning, there are other processes that would be required if an, an, a, a prospective purchaser was looking to do something different, there are other opportunities that could be considered, and that is what uh, Realty would take a look at should council wish to go down that route. Thanks very much. I then have Councillor Van Holst on the list. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to our, our, our staff as well. The uh, As I looked at it, certainly operational, we've, we've said golf should pay for golf, but with a $105,000 loss, that's it's 95% pays for itself, more than that. So I think we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing fairly well. So I appreciate that. And of course, there seems to be the possibility that uh, we could do even better. Certainly the uh, Golf Ontario's uh, suggested some ideas that when you look at them are, 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 are quite interesting. Um, so, let me ask uh, just just a few questions, and then maybe I'll make some comments as well to start things off. But um, were this particular property, uh, were we to sell it, how much developable land is there? That may be a question for Mr. Warner, if Mr. Warner's on the line. Okay. 
uh, through the chair, no, Mr. Warner uh, is not, hasn't joined us. Um, I'm trying to find that information quickly if I have that there. There, there is um, approximately 11 acres that could be subject to further study in terms of potential development, but uh, there'd be some further work we would have to undertake to look at what that is. There is uh, a large majority of it that cannot be developable, but there is a portion that uh, that is possible. So that uh, those next <coughs> steps, we would proceed to investigate that. It should council wish us to proceed. Councilor Van Holst. Okay, well, thank you very much. And so. And certainly uh, using this as a golf course uh, would be a, a great use from the from the public. Although if they can make a go of it, then again, we wonder why, why could we not do the same? Uh, so, I, I, you know, I will point out that selling River Road is the most extreme and irrevocable uh, decision we could make uh, tonight. So I, you know, I would hope that we would uh, spend a little time in our discussions looking for something that's that's not as extreme and and irrevocable the uh, perhaps i i would ask again looking in that to that um, the idea of uh, having to renew the the clubhouses uh, what what uses could our our clubhouses have for more than just golf if we're going to have to invest money in these things then uh, certainly I think golf wouldn't have to pay for itself completely if it were if those properties are being used for other recreational uh, ideas uh, or activities as well. So, what could be done with with uh, a clubhouse for the community if we were to to go that route if we were to redo them? Mr. Stafford, uh, thank you. And through the chair. One of the uh, the thoughts around uh, one of the clubhouses in particular at Thames Valley is is part of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan that that would turn into a year round community center uh, type facility. So with some of the investment that would uh, be able to go into that would turn that into a, a facility that would be able to utilize in the winter for recreational classes. Uh, uh, community gathering spot and uh, it would also allow for uh, some investment that. Uh, would perhaps turn the clubhouse into an, the opportunity for, uh, you know, small uh, gatherings, uh, office meetings, uh, uh, community club meetings, those types of things. And those uh, those ideas, if, if successful, uh, could move into uh, the other property as well. Councillor Van Holst. Uh, thank you very much. And that is a multi-use is really, a, it has some very, some exciting opportunities. I'd, I described some examples that I, I'd seen elsewhere, but uh, I think I'll s save my time uh, and uh, just move along uh, some other uh, <clears throat> routes. The uh, I'm, I'm, it's too bad that we didn't have uh, weren't able to have people just show up and speak because I, I know there's some there was many ideas that have been shared with me as the, as the ward counselor. But what could be done? Uh, one of them, of course, was. Uh, the possibility of hiring, uh, uh, for instance, a nonprofit to manage the facility. I know that's something we do with our, our two water supply uh, institutions. Or I, I, I'm on the board of both of those, and uh, we hire Aqua to run it, although we own it. And that, that seems to work well. So uh, I wonder if our staff could comment on the possibility of that. Before I ask staff to comment, I just want to remind colleagues just to be clear that uh, the public was invited to participate as this is a public participation meeting. We did get two specific individuals and we had dozens literally of individuals who have written in with a variety of comments and suggestions. So I just want to set the record straight that, uh, that this was an opportunity and today's meeting was an opportunity for, for the public to respond in whatever way they they uh, they deemed. Uh, Mr. Stafford, do you wish to respond to Councilor Reynolds? Yeah, if, I, if I can, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, just responding to your own comments is that, you know, unfortunately, I did talk to a number of people that were would be uh, would have been interested in speaking today. However, it uh, the holiday Monday um, kind of set them back a little bit. So that was where we might have otherwise been able to uh, make a request and have it in this uh, yesterday morning. 
that was not possible. So there was a there were a, a, a number of people that were not able to to speak who I think would have enjoyed. But um, there we are. So noted, Councilman Holst. Thank you very much, Mr. Stafford. Do you wish to respond to Councilman Holst's other comments? Uh, thank you, and through the chair, uh, it would take some time to investigate the the possibilities and uh, all the uh, intricacies of uh, and various layers of uh, nonprofit uh, operating this uh, opportunity. Um, the one thing I do want to keep in mind is that it's a large capital deficit that would not be solved by that solution. So that's as we mentioned in our report. Uh, it is one of the things we investigated around leasing or or off managing the uh, the property while still owning it. And uh, it wouldn't provide that initial uh, influx of capital that would help support the uh, the deficit uh, of the capital assets going forward. Councilor? Just one last question uh, for now. Uh, how did our, how, how did we ar arrive at this capital uh, situation, this deficit situation uh, is, was there, we just didn't have the opportunity to plan for it? Because I know this issue came up about 10 years ago and uh, had we, uh, I think, been taking the kind of actions, uh, planning for pay-as-you-go as we do in other areas of the city, we might have been in a little better position than this, but perhaps we could have a comment uh, on, on, on how we got here. Mr. Stafford, please. Yeah, through the chair, there was a, a recommendation report uh, similar but different uh, 10 plus years ago around the uh, the recommendation of closure as well uh, with some of the same issues um, but capital assets and capital deficiencies grow over time um, we do invest and, and protect and invest in pumps and various things in the clubhouse and, and on the course to to work with that life cycle renewal uh, there's just not enough revenue coming in uh, to handle the ongoing and expected capital deficit going forward. And that's why we're bringing this forward to you today. Thank you. Was that uh, your last question for now, Councillor Reynolds? I, I think I've uh, taken enough of the committee's time for now. I'll uh, probably hope to speak again, but certainly I'm interested in hearing what my colleagues have to say. Certainly will be uh, your your opportunity and your pleasure, uh, Councillor and uh, Councillor Hillier. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Going over this KPMMG report, I'm realizing the data is pre-COVID, and I feel golf is seeing a huge comeback since COVID began. I have trouble supporting this, as many of you have spoken to in the past. In Ward 14, we don't have a lot of city services for our residents to use, and I have 2,500 homes being built over the next couple of years. And those residents deserve something to do. Just last week at committee, four members of this council said yes to an art projector for downtown, $300,000. I'm sorry, but this is a golf course on this end of town, we don't have a lot. My concern is if we lose this property, we'll never be in the position to find land like this again. I truly support if we sell this, we sell it as a golf course. My question is what about the, the uh, sorry, the Upper Thames River Conservation Area would it be turned into a park, that area? And what would be the cost to maintain that? And I believe the question about how much would the 11 acres be worth to sell privately has already been asked. Mr. Stafford. Uh, thank you and through the chair. Uh, maintenance of a park uh, would be in the $10,000 uh, per hectare range. Uh, and that's what we, we typically bring forward uh, for a basic, uh, basic facility. I will uh, refer to Ms. Barbone again for the realty uh, decisions that, that go with this property. Ms. Barbone. Uh, yes, thank you through the chair. So the, the UTRCA, um, the city used to lease this land uh, previously. And uh, in 2018, the UTRCA transferred this land to the city of London. At that time, um, the city of London purchased it at fair market value, which was $1.8 million. So that was in 2018. That was the value as operated at uh, as a golf course, which was its highest and best use at that time. So certainly, um, whether that's representative of a willing buyer in the future, um, we can't confirm till we were to go out to market, but certainly that was the valuation and the cost that the City of London paid at that time. Kester Hillier. 
And can you also tell me, have clubhouse sponsorships been looked at? I know we're having trouble with our clubhouses. Have they been looked at private sponsorships? Mr. Stafford. Thank you. And through the chair, yes, we've, uh, we've reached out over the past uh, couple of years now, at, at least to, to look at a variety of different opportunities in sponsorship and marketing. Uh, so some of those are, uh, have been pursued and haven't been uh, uh, fruitful, uh, but we will continue uh, to look at those opportunities uh, in a variety of ways on the, on the golf course as far as sponsorship and marketing. Have we, have we made those opportunities public so that people know other than the ones we've approached? Mr. Stafford. Uh, through the chair, we do have a sponsorship and a marketing uh, person on staff. Uh, over the last couple of years that, that reaches out uh, through the network and uh, uh, goes through different ways. We've had to actually, uh, through a procurement opportunity, uh, a couple of times with, with some different things that they just haven't worked out at this point in time. And uh, they all, uh, they haven't been as simple as a sponsorship sign. Uh, there's There's been other uh, around merchandising and uh, a product uh, bartering uh, so they haven't been fruitful at this point but we'll continue with that councillor that's all thank you thank you uh, councillor hopkins next yeah thank you mr chair and uh thank you for uh the report uh as well we asked for it and here it is and i'm really um, looking forward to the debate and the conversation and appreciate all the questions so far i do have two quick questions through you mr chair to staff the first question is about the audit report that uh was presented to us i i guess it came uh, in january 2020 uh pre-covid and as we've uh, had to go through COVID this past year. I know uh, municipalities, all, all forms of governments have had to sort of reassess their plans uh, and timelines in particular. And just wondering uh, what is the rush to make a decision? Is there, is there a rush right now that we have to make this decision or is this just the um, after effects of the audit report coming to us and here we are today? Mr. Stafford. Mr. Uh, thank you and through the chair. And I, I, I think there are, are both actually. I think uh, part of this is uh, it is coming back as, uh, as asked for, uh, as you mentioned. So I appreciate that. It is coming back in that timeline. It is coming back prior to the season. Um, we did delay a little bit in, in hopes that we'd have a, you know, maybe a different uh, scenario in, in the COVID situation, but it was it was getting to a place where we needed to bring it back for decision prior to the season in a reasonable time. Um, the other part is in the urgency, if, if I may, is the decision upon where we're at as far as financials in order to go forward uh, with the capital needs that we have and the amount of money we have in the reserve fund. Uh, we currently have approximately $150,000 in the reserve fund. That can certainly uh, handle some of the incidentals uh, but if we continue with the loss or if we come up with a major expenditure uh, that's the money that we have to deal with it so that's that's the sense of urgency if there is one councilor hopkins yeah thank you for that and my second question is uh and i speaking of COVID, do we know if we are going to be opening up our golf courses this year given that we are still in COVID, we are anticipating the variant and, and the third wave and just wondering when a decision will be made as we move forward. Mr. Stafford. Uh, thank you and through the chair. We do anticipate being able to open the golf course uh, uh, this summer uh, or this spring. Uh, we had many safety protocols in place last year during the, uh, during the various uh, uh, stages of COVID. Uh, we were able to operate until December 1st was the, the last day that we actually had golf in the city of London. And we do anticipate that we'll be able to uh, open under COVID protocols uh, again this spring, summer. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lehman. <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. Um, you know, what I noticed uh, from the conversation so far, the biggest thing, uh, one of the things that's come out is that golf pays for golf. Um, it does. Uh, golfers uh, and the revenue they generated 
paid for the development uh, of River Road Golf Course. And not only does golf pay for golf, but golf at one time, uh, when golf was more popular, uh, paid over a million dollars to other forms of recreation in, in our city. So, you know, I have to balance that with the fact that, you know, as report has seen, we've seen over the last, you know, for sure five years, not more, uh, golf participation at River Road has gone down. In fact, golf participation um, in North America has gone down over that time. Golf seems to be a peak and valley type of thing. So now um, times have also changed because we've seen COVID come on the scene. And we've seen golf participation, uh, as mentioned, gone up by 25% uh, in the city. And we've seen a lot of frustration for folks out trying to enjoy the sport with uh, lack of access to the facilities that they paid for. So I can understand the frustration in the golfing community right now. As mentioned by uh, other councillors uh, in the East End, uh, if this were to close with population growth out there, uh, the facilities that so many enjoy uh, w would be lacking. That said, um, uh, we are seeing capital reserves uh, dwindle down to a, a critical point. Um, capital expenditure on, on golf courses is a, cru a crucial thing to keep, keep them playable and to keep it uh, uh, in reasonable shape to keep participation up. Um, so that's, that's what I'm, I'm balanced with. What I don't want to see is I don't want to see another year where this facility lies fallow while COVID is on because we're not going to be all vaccinated until September. Uh, we've seen the social uh, stresses that COVID has caused and the outlet that outdoor sports uh, has provided. I guess the question is, is this a blip uh, in golf participation? Or is this more of a long-term thing? I know I've discovered uh, other activities, for example, walking the wonderful trails that we have in London. Uh, when COVID goes away, I will continue uh, to enjoy that activity. So I imagine the number of people who have discovered golf will continue that way as well. So I would hate to see um, you know, the course uh, shut down over this summer. However, we do have to look at the long-term thing. And will trends continue in the way they have been where uh, we are stressed financially? My question to staff would be, um, is it possible to continue to operate the golf course um, while having discussions with potential private operators that might consider uh, the purchase of the golf course to keep it running um, as a golfing enterprise? Mr. Stafford? Uh, through the chair, I'll, I'll defer this in a moment to uh, Ms. Barbone. Um, I think there's a, you know, twofold. I think some businesses, when you're selling the whole business, uh, customer and all, I think it's very valued that uh, that the customer is is there and, and is part of the, uh, the goodwill of the business. Um, we're in a bit of a different situation and uh, where we have members of three different properties and, and four different golf courses and whether the goodwill goes with the golf course or stays with the other properties is a, is a question that, uh, that would arise. So I just want to put that out there uh, as a bit of a difference in, in selling a business in particular, but I will hand it over to Ms. Barbone if, uh, if there are some real issues. Good, Ms. Barbone. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, certainly that is one possibility. Um, I think uh, the biggest challenge is that um, the City of London will need to manage its overall financial impacts as a result of COVID and that there would be a cost and uh, certainly a shortfall that the City of London would need to cover and find alternate means to be able to pay for that in the meantime. Um, certainly from a financial perspective, user fees are, are set and based on what's uh, identified through our um, 
user fee by law and, and there is a public participation required in order to change fees. So if you were to change it and sell it midway, um, there would certainly be an impact on the remainder of the courses potentially and on the pricing model you'd need to do refunds, etc. and try to determine what that impact would be mid-year to be able to couple the, cover the cost. Um, the city overall is facing, we're, we're estimating a $20 million shortfall just in user fees alone. So certainly through our monitoring reports, we will be very closely monitoring the impacts of all our businesses as the uh, province allows us to open up. So if there's additional cost impact midway, we would need to factor that in. But uh, certainly depending on what the kind of use is, if there are alternatives from a realty perspective, if it was going to be continued to operate as a golf course, the asset might be transferable a little bit easier than if someone were to begin development, etc. So it really does depend on what kind of marketing would be done and what kind of uh, useful um, use it would have to a buyer who was interested in purchasing the course and for what purposes. Councillor Lehman. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just wrap up uh, with uh, this. Um, you know, at one time, uh, golf helped out other recreation uh, facilities uh, across London. Um, COVID has changed things. I think there needs to be uh, a continued out, outlook or a uh, break from, for people to get out um, to uh, relieve the stresses uh, that we've seen. So for sure, I don't want to see it shut down this year. I understand um, our financial officer uh, expressing the, the, um, the strain on city finances. Uh, during this time as well. Um, and I'm very, uh, very aware of that. However, um, you know, the, uh, the slight underfunding uh, that could happen through this year's uh, operation would be more than covered by the eventual sale of the property. Um, it wouldn't be taking uh, money out of the coffers from taxpayers. It would still be golf pays for golf. Golfers paid for that course uh, when it's sold. If it has to be sold, then golf golfers would pay for the deficit of the monies that come out of it. So um, thank you for uh, allowing me to give you my thoughts. Thank you. Councillor Morgan. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I have a couple of questions and then some comments. Um, my first is on um, the idea that golf pays for golf. Um, and I, I know that we've mentioned that that's, you know, part of our, our policy or, or what we're aiming for, but I, I think we're talking about direct costs. We're not talking about like Mr. Stafford charging back part of his time or the back end supports that the corporation gives the, the asset overall. Um, like the, the city is still involved in absorbing a number of the management costs of the asset, um, you know, at a, at a higher level. Is that, is that true? Mr. Stafford. Uh, thank you. And through the chair, yes, as KPMG's report uh, mentions, that is the case. Yes. Councilor Morgan. Yes. So, so I think that's important uh, because the golf is one of, you know, one component of the assets that we manage. And, you know, at times it has supported uh, other recreational assets. At times it has needed support. At other times we have strived to run it, you know, uh, as a fairly self-contained uh, entity. Um, what we do know is... Um, that uh, actually, I got one more question for Ms. Barbone before I get into some of the comments. Um, during the um, uh, the comments that Ms. Barbone made, she said in 2018, when we we purchased the the course instead of leasing it, uh, the golf was its its highest and best use. Um, and I just want to confirm that 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 was the case in our analysis. Ms. Barbone. Uh, thank you through the chair. I'm just going through my notes to recall exactly um, what had happened. So when the purchase occurred, we had been um, leasing the course for quite some time. So when the city purchased the remainder of the course, it wasn't the entire property. We were only purchasing a portion of the land that was valued. So um, 
there, it was a little bit complicated because it wasn't just a straightforward transaction for the entire course at the time. So there was only 120 acres for the land only. The city already owned the clubhouse at that time. So the valuation of what we paid wasn't strictly for the entire course operating as a golf course at that time. It was simply for the transfer so we could ensure that the valuation was at fair market value for the purchase from the UTRCA. So one of the things that uh, we would need to do if we were to proceed would be to then look at um, the valuation and have an appraisal done at that time so that we can get an estimate. And this would be the work that um, our Mr. Warner would undertake for any property. We would then do the appraisal and have an independent firm that would look at it for the highest and best use. So I can't confirm that that was the, we looked at multiple options at that time because it was being operated and we were only transferring a portion of the land, it made sense at that time because a lot of the portion that was being transferred was not developable at that time. So um, it, it's a bit of a complicated way to say that was the valuation for a large chunk of the golf course, but not for the entire entity as a whole that we might undertake if we were to proceed to sell it as a golf course. Now. Deputy Mayor. Okay, that makes a lot more sense to me that we're consolidating some parcels of land into a single ownership and probably puts us in a, a, a better position to, you know, have an assessment of the value of the overall and more complete parcel. Um, uh, the, the reason why I was asking was there was some question about, you know, would it be used for golf or something else? And I wouldn't want to speculate, but knowing, you know, what analysis was done in the past um, would have been helpful. But now I now I understand where you were going with that. I, what I want to say too is, um, you know, golf is a is an overall asset that the city has, and and for me, you know, it, it's not necessarily necessarily just the the performance of one component of that asset, but the system as a whole. And and what we do know is that we have a significant financial hole uh, and an unfunded uh, capital need in the overall golf system, eight hundred eighty one thousand of which uh, is at this location. Uh, and we have a reserve fund with $150,000 in it, which is not even close to enough to uh, to, to deal with the, the needs of the overall assets. And so in the report, the, the component that is important to me in the recommendations is in any sort of sale of the asset is, is dealing with a portion of, of that capital um, gap that exists. In other words, keeping the proceeds of the sale within the reserve fund to immediately lop off part of our, our infrastructure deficit that we would have in the Gulf system and strengthening the remaining components of that Gulf system by dealing with some of the 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 the, the capital needs, um, some of which I, I believe will you know improve the asset from my understanding of my discussions with Mr. Stafford about you know what those are. Um, and, and you automatically you lop off at least 881k of that need because you no longer need to maintain the asset. Ideally, the new owner would 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 make the upgrades they feel is necessary. So, I think there's there's a perspective here about the system as a whole that is important um, because, on one hand, you can say the city of London is selling a golf course. On the other hand, you can say the city of London is rationalizing its golf assets and, and dealing with some of the infrastructure gap components by you know selling off a portion of those assets to strengthen the remaining portions so that they're viable for this foreseeable future without significant need of you know, taxpayer subsidization, right? Whether or not you agree that we should do that or not, the, the subsidization piece, it puts us in a better position overall on, on, the, on the capital side of things. So that is an important consideration for me in this is the strength of the asset overall moving forward. And in some cases you have to make tough decisions. So I appreciate the debate so far. Uh, I just wanted colleagues to know the types of things that I'm thinking about in, in this discussion uh, beyond what has already been raised too. So thank you. Thank you. I've got everyone that has wanted to speak thus far once. Um, I've got a couple of other keeners here. Let's uh, start then with uh, Councillor Turner and then uh, go to Councillor Van Meerbergen with the understanding that if you've spoken once, we will circle back to you for those who wish to speak again. Councillor Turner, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my apologies for my tardiness to the meeting, and uh, my apologies if I cover some ground that's already been covered. I was just trying to formulate some thoughts here. <clears throat> um, if I might, I, I think as I take a look through the report, there's a, a few themes that come forward. Um, one, uh, it looks like uh, perhaps the decision not to operate River Road this past year might have been the wrong one. 
Uh, I think that threw us into a, a greater operating deficit than we would have had we operated the course uh, 300,000 in a deficit because there was a, a fairly significant um, uh, overhead to operating uh, and to maintaining the course while it wasn't being used. Uh, is that fair to characterize? Uh, because uh, I think in previous years, our operating deficit was in the, uh, in the 20 to $30,000 range and maybe up to upwards of 70,000, but never as much as this. Mr. Stafford. Uh, thank you and through the chair. And yes, I, I, I did address that question earlier, but I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll give a quick answer as quick as I can. Um, we did operate uh, and maintain uh, the assets. Uh, we did that in, in sports fields. We did that in buildings. We did that in, uh, in Labatt Park, for example, uh, where we had one exhibition game. Uh, it was important to maintain the, uh, the greens and fairways in particular uh, to make sure that they uh, weren't susceptible to disease and, and that we'd lose them and create a, a, greater, uh, a greater issue there. Um, it's not as simple as if we add revenue, uh, we don't add expense. Uh, we had a very limited uh, crew there, one, one and a half people at, uh, at most times trying to just maintain those assets, as I mentioned. As we add revenue, we add expense, whether it be pro shop. We also have to make the course in, uh, in a greater playable condition. And I know there was some, uh, some question around, it looked playable to me, it was already playable. And uh, I think if, uh, and I apologize for using the Labatt Park example, but if you, if you walked into Labatt Park, uh, you would have thought that looked playable. Uh, when you went on the field, uh, you realized it wasn't uh, to the playable standard that it normally would be. And that was the same situation at, uh, at River Road Golf Course. And certainly on that first day that it was cut, I'm sure it, uh, it looked playable, but it uh, wouldn't be after that. And um, so to add the revenue, it's always a, a revenue net loss uh, situation. So if we add simple uh, $400,000 in revenue, we would have added 400 plus in expenses. And that would have uh, would have created in that 50 to $80,000 uh, uh, range of, of greater loss if we had operated. And just because uh, revenue does not match expenses there. Um, Councilor Turner. <laughs> Yep, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't seem consistent with previous year performances uh, in terms of the deltas uh, in, in the KPMG report. Uh, there were losses in, in those years, uh, but to nowhere close to this extent. Uh, and if there had been uh, operating losses to the same degree as in previous years, uh, the, uh, the losses would have been less than what was realized in 2020. That, I think that's my point here, is that, yeah, I recognize there's expenses that go with operating the place, um, but it would have had counter revenues to those, uh, those operating expenses and, uh, and perhaps would have cost less in terms of lost revenues. I, th I think the challenge ends up being that the, uh, in order to, uh, what happened last year is extraordinary year and, and a judgment call had to be made. And, and, I, um, and I, I don't second guess that. I, I think more the point is what, uh, what does that leave for an indication of future performance? Uh, I'll, I'll say off the, the hop, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm generally supportive of, uh, of the recommendations. I think they make sense. However, I think there's some assumptions that are made in the report that aren't consistent with, uh, with the realities, I think. Uh, perhaps uh, through you, um, Your Worship, a second question might be around uh, what examination there was in terms of, uh, because uh, what examination there was around increasing fees. Um, it looked like there was about a 5% gap in fees versus what we needed to be in terms of break-even costs. Um, and I, I don't know if that uh, was reasonable. The other challenge though is even with um, a cash infusion through the sale of assets to go against the reserve uh, for, that, um, for that $6 million or six, yeah, $6 million that'll be needed over the next 10 years, uh, that buys us the, that time but we're still not <clears throat> in a, a net positive situation where we're putting uh, 600 or $60,000, sorry, $600,000 a year into reserves on an ongoing basis. Uh, we, we really should be at that sustainable level that we're contributing to reserves and we're generating enough revenue that notwithstanding any sale of asset and sudden infusion into the reserve, that we're able to maintain the operation in such a way that covers all our costs on both sides of the, of the ledger.
Um, so perhaps a little bit of comment on that. Stafford, do you wish to comment? Yes, through the chair. Um, bang on with your, your uh, question and there isn't enough there. You're right. So that's why we're here. And that's why we're here with this discussion today. So that the one and a half million dollars or 1.8 as Ms. Barbone has talked about as, as potential value. And, and that is certainly just potential. We have to go through the process. Doesn't solve the problem, uh, but taking away the one property that is consistently uh, at a loss, adding more to the other two properties because there will be less properties. There will be hopefully more golfers at those properties that will add to the revenue that's brought into the reserve fund each year. Hopefully that'll get us to a place that we can be more sustainable. Uh, that is the goal. That's where we're at. That's where we're hoping to get to. But when we brought the report back in, uh, in February of last year, we were asked to look at the option of River Road. The other options were taken off the table. KPMG in their report had suggested uh, disbursement or uh, discontinuation of a variety of options, uh, including all of the golf properties because of the situation. Uh, we believe this is an opportunity to bring us to a more sustainable spot. I think there's lots of work to still be done there from marketing and sponsorship that was mentioned earlier uh, to making sure that we get these places into a sustainable situation for the long term. I think this is our best opportunity. This is why we're bringing this forward. But you're right, it's a, it's a big deficit. Uh, as Councillor Morgan had mentioned, we, we eliminate the capital deficit from the River Road property uh, and we eliminate the uh, traditional uh, uh, historical ongoing deficit from that property uh, and allow the other properties to, uh, to grow and sustain. And hopefully our golf courses like the quarry and other courses uh, are able to uh, increase their participation as well. That's true. Thank you. And perhaps, and finally, um, I appreciate that. Uh, and I think that's why I'm generally supportive of this because something needs to happen. Uh, but I think it's more than just this. And that's, that's what scares me a little bit is that we, we will continue to run a functional deficit uh, on the courses because of, uh, of that capital requirement, uh, regardless of whether we um, uh, divest ourselves of River Road because the other courses will continue to maintain that and that our fees may not be appropriate. And then on the other side of this is uh, uh, something else that was mentioned in the KPMG report saying that our operating costs were much higher than what uh, the private sector courses are. Uh, do we have strategies on fees and operating cost uh, adjustments to try and get those in line? Or is there something that uh, a factor in a public sector course that, um, that leads us uh, to, uh, to having higher costs than, than our counterparts in the private sector? Mr. Stafford. Uh, thank you, and through the chair. Uh, rates have always been a market evaluation. Uh, and that being said, it's always a difficult market evaluation. We typically bring our rates uh, to council approval uh, prior to other golf courses setting their rates. They get to see where we're at first. We're very public. Um, it's something that they get to, uh, to work on and see prior to us. And we don't get to react uh, to their rates and fees uh, as that goes. As that being said, I think we've been uh, appropriate in the market. Uh, our opportunities always have been to be affordable, uh, to be accessible. I think we've been in the appropriate location uh, for fees, but they aren't, uh, they aren't sustainable. I think we do have to look at the fee model again. And I think uh, you're gonna see, and I, I certainly hear through the golf industry that uh, golf fees are going up substantially this year. People are taking advantage of the demand that was out there in, in 2020 and uh, perhaps anticipated for 2021. We'll see how that works out. Um, but I think that is one of the challenges we face in, in trying to stay as, as nimble as we can in those, uh, in those market rate fees. And other, offer, other uh, providers certainly have the opportunity to change uh, more quickly that way. Uh, as, far as, as far as expenses, we certainly look at expenses. Um, you know, what others uh, may save or in, in one area, uh, we may save in another area with, uh, with opportunities for mass procurement and, and different things like that. So, I mean, economies of scale with the, the properties that we do have, I think we're able to benefit with some. Uh, that being said, I think there's other expenses that we can't compete with the private sector. Councilor Chair? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, those are my questions, uh, my, my general thoughts at this point, and I'll be interested to hear the rest of the discussion. Uh, I think golf is an important place for us to be in. And the question is, how much do we need to be in it? Uh, I, I, uh, golf uh, and recreation and these, uh, these opportunities uh, that sometimes uh, in, have private sector offerings at high prices uh, end up having uh, an effect of excluding those from from all walks to be able to participate. There's a fairly high cost of entry uh, and engagement in golfing just to begin with in terms of equipment, in terms of getting there. Um, the courses may not be uh, transit accessible. It's hard to carry your clubs on the on the bus. Um, but uh, certainly as a, as a kid who grew up um, uh, using his grandfather's clubs, uh, old wooden clubs and, uh, and not having a car in my family, uh, the opportunity to golf every once in a while uh, and, and not being a very wealthy family at all uh, was, was nice to be able to, to be engaged in that and, and have those opportunities. And I think it, uh, the city courses were key to that. Um, so I, I would hate to see us exit that market completely and, I, and that's not what's on the table here. Um, but uh, the, uh, the two courses, Fanshawe and, um, and uh, the Thames Valley are two great courses. Uh, the River Road course uh, is, is an added bonus. But if we can't sustain the operation, then we, we need to make the tough decisions. Um, I, I worry about the longevity uh, and those, those two specific areas uh, on both the operating cost side and our revenue side. I think those two together uh, will put us in an unsustainable situation where we start to have to make more difficult choices later on. This buys us a few years. And so I think we really need to get our strategy in order uh, so that we do have sustainability um, and uh, I mean, on the on the operating expense uh, revenue expenses, just straight on a year to year basis, fine. But um, but that uh, that capital requirement on the ongoing basis is where we're really going to get sunk if we don't uh, if we don't have a good strategy and beyond one time cash infusions of sales of assets, because that's not a sustainable strategy at all. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Van Merbergen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think fundamentally, this is actually the worst possible time that we could be closing this golf course, uh, right in the middle of a pandemic, um, at, a, at a time when it's been proven that outdoor recreation, such as golf, is at a premium and highly valued uh, by, by Londoners and by people generally across certainly our country. It, it gives us the therapy, the therapeutic benefits uh, to, to fight the negative effects, or certainly many of the negative effects of COVID. In many respects, uh, the outdoor participation that golf provides is a real antidote uh, to the situation that we find ourselves in. I think um, Mr. Uh, Lockley uh, from Golf Ontario touched on some really interesting points, and I certainly enjoyed his uh, information that he provided to us. Basically, he's corroborating the fact that uh, there was about a 23, 24% increase in golfing in Ontario in 2020. And again, and this has been touched on previously, by not opening River Road, we never really saw or could see what it was capable of in what I think is a new reset in terms of how the average Londoner values outdoor recreation, including golf. And so up till now, we don't know what this golf course can contribute. We don't know how this golf course can perform because we kept it closed. And I think that was a wrong decision. That can be overturned. We can open this course, see how it performs in 2021. We're still gonna be with COVID. We're still with those same parameters and revisit this, say a year from now at a future SPPC meeting. And I'd certainly be prepared to move that motion um, because I think it makes fundamental sense. Through the years since 1924, the golfers in this community have more or less paid their way and actually contributed, as Councillor Lehman has said, to other uh, activities in London. I think it's the least we can do before we, uh, entertain such a draconian move 
as chopping off one of the main limbs of our Gulf system. I think we also have to be careful that we don't tick off the existing membership uh, by pr providing them fewer opportunities for golf, um, by, by re shrinking what they've been used to. I've certainly heard from a number of them, and it sounds very clear to me that it could very well result in uh, a significant reduction in the membership base uh, that we have here in London in golf. So that's something to be careful of because that could destabilize the entire system, uh, not just River Road. Then there's the whole element of inclusivity. And this I think was touched on a little earlier, but the fact of the matter is by having these local courses within our city boundaries, we are saying to people, uh, you're included. Uh, if you wanna ride your bike to the course and rent some clubs, take public transit to the course, bring your own clubs, rent, what have you. These courses are made for you. Folks who don't have a car or access to a car, young people um, who are limited to bike travel and or bus, these are the courses that we provide for them. The private sector courses can't provide for, for uh, that group of people or those groups of people. So there's the inclusivity element to it. Uh, we talk a lot about it. Here it is staring us right in the face. Again, I think it's worth uh, opening it in this environment during the pandemic. It is a reset. It's a whole new parameter. I say we, we uh, give it a shot. I think we'd be very surprised at what we see. I think it's wrong for us to be making, 30 seconds. making a decision uh, without all the facts, without all the data. We don't have all the data. And yet we're going to make this rather um, drastic, I think, um, decision tonight. So again, I think it's worth, let's, let's open it up and check this out a year from now. I think it's very worthwhile. And I think we'd be very surprised at what we find. So I heard the makings of a motion there, Councillor Van Mierberg. And before we do that, though, I wonder this, we haven't heard from uh, Councillor Cassidy, and that will run us through the list that I have thus far of first time speakers. And of course, uh, if you want to come back in with a motion, you can, but we do have Councillor Squire and Lewis who are uh, looking to make additional comments. Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a, a couple of questions for Mr. Stafford through you. So uh, we see this $6 million needed over the next uh, few years uh, for capital upkeep uh, and improvements on, on the courses. Um, how does that, how does the timeline on that look? Uh, are there any capital, and I, you know, I, my apologies, if it was in the report, there was a lot in the report and I didn't memorize it all, but if, are there short-term needs, mid-term mid needs, and then longer-term needs? And if so, what, what are the shorter to mid-term financial needs uh, for the courses? Mr. Stafford. Uh, yes, thank you, and through the chair. I'm, uh, I'm going to bring in my colleague, uh, Mr. McGonigal, to, uh, to answer that question. Thank you. Good, Mr. McGonigal. Thank you, uh, and through the chair, uh, there is about a million dollars in capital needs uh, that are overdue, uh, that were due between 2013 and 2018. Oh, Those are the most pressing uh, of the items, uh, but that is across all three properties, just to provide some context as well. Okay. Thank Kask. you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, and through you, um, are there are there regular you know, the, just doing a separation of capital and operating costs. Are there regular day-to-day uh, -day capital costs that happen on an annual basis? And if so, what would those, for the whole golf system, what would the annual capital costs be that we just expect to have? Let's try Mr. McGonigal, I could be wrong. I'm gonna take this one, but we'll, we'll hand off to Mr. McGonigal for, I was for wrong. details. <laughs> Thank you. Um, through the chair, there are uh, annual, we try to keep those into the operating expenses. So those annual things like fertilizer and, uh, and regular maintenance that, that go on there. But there are uh, 
forestry costs, for example, with uh, you know a, a beautiful properties that we have, and certainly from 1924 at Thames Valley, uh, uh, forestry costs that go on, uh, a good woodland in uh, River Road and uh, Fanshawe as well. So those are costs that are uh, can be capital costs that go on. Uh, irrigation and pump uh, repairs that go on, uh, and then as we get into uh, to buildings, there's there's certainly as the uh, the buildings age, there's there's HVAC and roofing and electrical and and a variety of things like that that we can anticipate, and then there are some that uh, are unanticipated. So we do have a we do have a plan of uh, of activities that that we work on uh, to try and proceed through the life cycle renewals. Uh, cart paths, for example, and a variety of other things, but uh, certainly there are some some items that come up uh, that are unanticipated or they come up sooner than anticipated. Uh, but we do have a, a plan of, of regular costs and then there's a, a plan of, of longer term things that as we, you know, if we get into a larger reserve fund that we can develop some uh, modernization of golf courses and, uh, and, some, and playability enhancements and things like that. Councilor Cassidy. Thank you. Um, thank you for that answer as well. Um, uh, going on back to what uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Morgan had mentioned about Mr. Stafford's time and various uh, support through from finance, through uh, realty, through whatever different departments and divisions at the City of London, there's an aspect of golf that is subsidized by the ratepayers that is not covered in the in the fees. I wonder, you mentioned those forestry costs. Do we use our our own internal departments to to maintain the the trees and things like that, or is that something that's handled by golf staff? Mr. Stafford, uh, through the chair, it, it's a combination of both actually. So uh, some are uh, are uh, smaller caliber uh, trees that are are able to be handled by the golf staff. They're all trained as, as greenskeepers, and that's part of their. Uh, Part of their duties as well, but then as there, there's some bigger items that, uh, as you can imagine, with uh, some of the large size trees that you'll see on a Tenth Valley or or River Road or Fanshawe, for example, that uh, we bring in larger crews to to help with those situations. Okay, Councilor Cassidy. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, final question is: uh, Is there any ability as we move forward? Uh, it, let's say we are able to dig ourselves out of this hole and start to build in the into the reserve fund there. Is there any uh, capacity on Thames Valley and or Fanshawe to add holes there at some point in the future? Mr. Stafford. Uh, thank you and through the chair. I believe those are uh, full to capacity as far as the number of holes. The Fanshawe property uh, began as an 18 hole property and has expanded into a nine hole accessible uh, opportunity. Uh, nine holes were added uh, many years ago and, and another nine after that. So it is, uh, is pretty much at full capacity there and, and Thames Valley with the 27 holes uh, is full capacity there as well. Councillor. Thank you. Um, so I just wanna make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, we were, we were in a unique situation last year with COVID-19 and, and absolutely there was increased demand, not only for golf, but all sorts of recreational activities and the rec recreational activities were limited because certain things were shut down completely. Golf was able to continue operating. Um, and so there absolutely was a surge in demand. People weren't able to go into work. Um, and so a lot of people had more free time to pursue these recreational activities and people were, you know, frankly going stir crazy uh, in their homes. So of course there was this surge in demand. So I would say that 2020 was a unique year for that reason, and, and, and that probably contributed to that increased desire for golf, coinciding with uh, greater lag time between tee-offs and things like that, the ability to have fewer golfers on the course every single day. Uh, so there was increased demand and, and a definitely a lowering of supply. So that led to frustration, and I understand the frustration I heard from many people about that. But um, we won't be in lockdown forever. In fact, we, as of today, we're, you know, we've, we've come out of the strictest part of lockdown and we are moving towards a, a, a greater opening of society. And as we see the vaccines coming out, that will change things as well. And so, uh, you know, and this, 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 we keep saying golf pay, pays for golf, golf pays for golf. We see all sorts of recreational programs in the city of London that are partially funded through user fees. And this is what we've done with golf. We have 
Um, we have a, a certain amount like Mr. Stafford's time and staff at, in City Hall and things like that, that are paid through the rates, through the levy, and then the membership fees to pay for the substantial costs of the golf courses themselves. But, you know, we have swimming programs, we have arts programs, we have all sorts of programs that people pay a user fee to be able to participate in those things. And the difference with golf and the difference with our community centers is our community centers host a variety of activities. And golf is pretty limited in what it can offer, which is golf. And hopefully at some point in the future, we can expand those as we're able to improve the overall golf system. I see this big barrier uh, in the way, and this is this looming deficit, this, this $6 million capital uh, requirement that we have that we can't fund right now, unless we go back to the multi-year budget, open it up again, and go to the, uh, the taxpayers of the city of London and say, we're going to need more money because we need to improve these golf pro courses. I, I don't think that's going to sit 30 well seconds. with the majority. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't think that's going to sit well with the majority of taxpayers in the city of London. So those are my concerns right now. Um, I think what we can do, we have the opportunity to make two really great golf courses, but we can't, if, as, if, as long as we keep pouring money into this pit, that doesn't seem to have an end. Thank you. Councilor Squire. Um, I'm going to make some comments now. Um, the, the last question I had was actually the one about the, the Councilor Turner asked, and I think it's the key, one of the key points here is that um, I think we put ourselves in this situation by having this concept or philosophy of golf paying for golf. Because golf, it appears, can no longer pay for golf. Um, it can no longer not just meet the operating expenses and make a small profit. It's not over time going to make a big enough contribution on its own um, to cover the capital costs of, uh, of golf. So I think... Although it's a philosophy, I think if we continue with that philosophy, I think we're going to be even in worse shape um, than we are now. Because even with the sale of River Road and that $1.8 million, we're still going to have a huge capital deficit in golf. And so it is a recipe for us to have another discussion or another council have a, few, a discussion in a few years about closing something else. So we are not on a sustainable path here if we continue to think that golf uh, can fund golf. You know, I, I had a chat with a private golf uh, operator who said, uh, who had 36 holes and said he could make more money if he just plowed under 18 of his holes. Um, because golf is a very challenging sport to, to operate at the highest level. And I can tell you fees everywhere are going up. And, and, and I think the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to be looking for new operating expenses for whatever golf courses we have. And people are going to be having to look at increased fees because I can tell you in the private golf business, fees are going up. They're going up, up, up. And um, I don't know how we can sort of ignore that going forward. So I think we put ourselves in this position um, by doing, doing the, keeping on, if we keep on with the idea that well, the only money that's going to go in the Golf Capital Reserve Fund is uh, the money, the $1.8 million from Selling River Road and this little operating surplus um, that Thames and Fanshawe are generating. And if you look at that, the, the report says it was, uh, would have been $79,000 annual contribution to that capital fund, but we need the actual annual funding gap is $615,000. So we're not catching up. And golf's a really capital intensive uh, business, very capital intensive. And golf courses wear out. They, they have to be rebuilt. They have to, you know, greens and fairways have to be rebuilt. So I think we're on a, I, I, I personally will not endorse any future concept of golf pays for golf because it's, I think we might as well get out of the golf business and just say, look, we're not gonna do golf then. And we're gonna have to figure out a more sustainable way to do the capital account maybe incorporating golf's capital account with other capital accounts. Um, because I, I have to say, the one thing I know from being a counselor for six years is we can, we can spend money. Um, we can really spend it. So I even worry that one day someone's going to go, you know that $1.8 million from River Road that's just a golf account? Let's use it for something different. Um, you know, that's, that's not out of the question either. So I think this continuing idea of saying, 
golf's going to be on its own. It has to generate enough money to keep golf going. It's just not a good idea. And I certainly am not going to endorse it anymore. And, and I got to say, saying that, well, you know, it's a philosophy, that's, that's, I mean, I have a lot of strange philosophies, but I don't expect people to follow them. Um, and, and I don't accept that someone can say, whether it's staff or anybody can say, well, this has been our philosophy, so you've got to follow it in the future. And so I just want to go on record as saying that I no longer recognize as being sustainable or feasible a golf must pay for golf philosophy because um, I just don't believe it is. So this is going to be a really hard vote. And I, to, to counselors who say, well, let's try and operate it for another year, that again is not even going to get you close to getting rid of that capital deficit. It's not even, it's not going to get you anywhere near. And that is the nut we have to crack, is that capital deficit. And until we figure out a way to do that, all the golf courses going into the future are going to be in peril. And, and in peril in terms of getting improvements, 30 the seconds. maintenance that they need. So that's where I am, and it's not a, not a great uh, situation. Councillor Lewis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to first say to, uh, I appreciate the comments from Councillor Turner, uh, who said a lot more eloquently some of the things I was trying to say in my initial remarks, so I appreciate him doing that. Um, because he's right, it, the, we're not talking about getting out of golf. It's about how big or what appropriate is this, what appropriate size it is that we're going to occupy. Um, I do have to say, uh, and I say this with all due respect uh, to my fellow East End councillors, uh, it is uh, not actually an appropriate comment to say that we will have no services, programs, offerings in the East End. Um, Fanshawe is in the East End. Yes, it's at the other end of Clark Road, but it is an East End asset. Um, then we look at the private courses. And again, golf is unique because we're competing with the private sector in a way we do not compete with them in other recreational activities. Uh, but you've got Crumlin's 12-hole course. You've got Forest City National, uh, East Park. Those are all in the East End as well. So it's just not accurate, in my view, to say that we won't have anything left in the East End. I also think it's really important to say, when we hear give it a year, see what happens, uh, you know, we don't know. Well, with all due respect, we do know. Because in 2010, 2011, a past council gave River Road a reprieve of one year. And what was the result? That information's in the report. For one year, River Road had fantastic attendance and playability. And as soon as council took the sale of River Road off the table at that time, the numbers plummeted back down to less than 50% capacity, in fact, under 45% capacity, sometimes under 40% capacity. As soon as they were able to go back to their other courses, they did. Uh, we heard about how unique uh, last year was. And it's important to recognize that it was unique and we should not be making assumptions based on last year. You know, we've, we saw in a lot of communications it was impossible to get a tea time. Well, we were still only at 70% capacity on our two courses that were open. So there were tea times available, perhaps not the preferred tea time, but there were tea times available. And I will, you know, rely on my uh, hockey experience here. You know, coaching uh, 11 or 12 year olds was the ideal tea time um, for ice because you got the prime time. Uh, if you had the little kids, you were on the ice at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, if you had the oldest kids, you were, weren't getting on the ice until 9 o'clock at night. So, uh, yeah, you do have to recognize that sometimes you're not going to get your ideal time. But there were times available. And yes, the rounds were up by 20%, a little bit more than that. But the revenue was down by about 20%. So those two things kind of cancel each other out. And you know what part of that can be attributed to, and I'm not by any means saying it's all attributed to that, but unlimited membership holders having more time to golf because their place of business was closed is not generating more revenue. It's just generating more demand. Uh, and as their places of business reopen, there won't be that opportunity. You know, when we hear about a, a $20 million uh, uh, anticipated shortfall on user fees across our system, uh, We've also got to recognize that our residents are already feeling economic stresses uh, with the property tax increase that we've passed on to them. 
Uh, and those were some very difficult debates too, but they're not seeing the kind of increases that are keeping up with those costs. So we really have to balance these things. I would like a golf system that's sustainable in the long run. And I think Councillor Morgan uh, made some excellent points about how you have to assess the system as a whole, how you have to remember that we're also removing a chunk of the capital need if we remove this course. I would love to see this course remain as a golf course. I think that is a great use for it. And I, I would be fascinated to see if it's up for sale, uh, what kind of private sector uh, interest might be generated to keep it as a golf course. This is a tough decision. I'm gonna have constituents who are gonna be furious with me if we vote to close this. But they're also gonna be furious with me if I tell them next year they've got a 6% tax hike coming because we wouldn't eliminate anything. And I'm, I'm just throwing that out there as a, as a random number. I'm not saying that that's at all what we're gonna land at. Uh, but we can't continue to just spend on a course that's proven historically. It's just not in high demand and it's just not turning around a profit. So, you know, I, I'm still listening, um, but it, it's hard to justify keeping this one going. Speaking of, uh, thank you, speaking of keeping this going, when we had the second round of speakers, what I should have said is we need to have something to talk about because otherwise we'll be talking about talking about talking about things and I really think we really need to bring some things to conclusion. So the way I'm gonna start, if you don't mind, uh, colleagues, is do we have anyone here that's prepared to move the staff recommendation? Your Worship, uh, just point of privilege. Uh, sure, Councillor Van Holst. Number, yeah, you've allowed a number of... Uh, uh, members to speak a second time. Uh, my hand was up before even the end of the second round. So uh, if you don't mind, I think it would be uh, appropriate to let me say a few more things. I've got some new uh, points and some new questions uh, that I think are relevant. Well, then let's hear them, Councillor Van Holst. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, let me. Yeah. So, so colleagues, when I, when I look at this, I see that um, we've got 700 and, uh, 721,000 if we add the capital and the uh, operating expenses needed. We've got what's a, a $2.8 million in revenue business running at 70% capacity that essentially needs uh, $360,000 more revenue and three hundred sixty thousand dollars less expenses, and that to me sounds like an attainable, uh, attainable thing. Now we know that we're not out of the woods, even if we do uh, sell River Road. So I mean, maybe the problem is not River Road, but that the city just can't run golf self sustainably, and we need to gauge other operators. So maybe KPMG. KPMG should be asked to evaluate that hypothesis. But uh, let me mention a few other things. Uh, first, by the way, I, I wanted, I didn't say this before, but I really like staff's recommendation number C is at least letting the, the benefits that uh, have accrued um, by, because of the golfers to, to the golfers. So I'm really happy with that. Um, my next question is that, what are the economies of scale uh, to, to the golf system? So if we sell River Road, then we're, we're losing uh, a chunk of that. And all of a sudden we're gonna have fewer economies of scale in golf, but we're gonna have a competitor that, that has greater uh, ones if, if it goes to a golfer, uh, a, a golf course. Uh, my other, I do have a question through uh, you, Mr. Chair, to staff. The treasurer talked about uh, having to provide some refunds if we change things uh, halfway through the year. Did any members get refunds this year when we, because of closing um, River Road? Because I, 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 people were asking for that when it first happened. Mr. Stafford, please. Yes, thank you through the chair. Yes, uh, members did receive a refund. Uh, I believe the total was uh, close to $100,000. And it was for two reasons. It was because of the, the less offering at River Road and because of the late start to the season uh, compared to the typical start. Okay, Councillor. All right, thank you very much. So a big question I have is, will the value of our memberships go down 
if uh, there are a few courses to play? And, and it seems like the answer to that is yes, because we're providing those, uh, those refunds. So that's, uh, that's another concern. Um, I also wonder how much golf revenue is made at the clubhouse versus the greens. And you know, if the clubhouse is the problem that needs to be fixed, maybe we should offer the private sector a chance to be involved in, in, in that. My uh, Sorry, Councillor, you've got a couple of things there. I just want to ask, is that a question to staff or were you making a statement? It wasn't clear to me. You know, I'm going to try. I think I'm going to make a, a couple statements. They may say, they could have been questions, but I'll, uh, if I want to direct them to staff, uh, your worship, I'll, 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 I'll you. do so. But um, so uh, now it was said that if we uh, divest ourselves of this, we'll still be comparative to other communities. But really, I like it when London is more attractive to other communities because we're we're hoping for assessment growth in our city, and this is another thing that makes makes it uh, makes it attractive. Uh, so the the kind of exciting thing that I heard. Uh, from people coming to me with ideas. One was that uh, there's, there's big opportunities there uh, for doing things a little differently at, at, at River Road. And it was mentioned that there are, there are communities that are starting to get into golf and that there's a chance to bring diversity into this. The, uh, the Latino community and the Korean community were, were described as uh, two that are that are moving in that direction. Uh, I was also told that the there seems to be opportunity to bring our indigenous youth into into this sport, and uh, a nonprofit uh, would be able to take on those things and access money that we would not be able to get as a uh, as a as a city. And so there was a business model being bandied around and coming together. And I really wanna see that uh, before, we, before we pass, uh, before we get rid of this course, it seems like this is a really, uh, as I said before, irre irrevocable action that we, that, we don't, that we don't want to take right away before we see some other possibilities. So there's great ideas. Many members have brought them up and I can't believe that a, uh, that a combination of those uh, makes it impossible for us to, to uh, make golf sustainable. So that's the, that's the goal. And I think at this point, um, I'm, I'm certainly not interested in, uh, in, in approving that the sale of this course, uh, I would like to refer it back as well. I think that suggestion was made. 30 seconds. Uh, and I would be happy to uh, second a motion like that. And also I'd be happy to make a motion that we simply abandon the uh, philosophy of God, golf, pays for golf, because I think that that got us in trouble because we, we didn't go after the capital uh, needs that we had back in 2013 and even 2014 in our last council session, if we'd been really clear on this and it, we hadn't said, well, golf just pays for golf, we would have taken these things on and be able to do it in a way that again, not only brings in uh, new people uh, into the sport, but also uh, makes better use of the facilities we have for other activities. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I wonder this, to be fair to Councillor Van Meerbergen, who had the initial uh, uh, pieces of emotion, I think that uh, takes precedence over even the staff recommendation at this stage. I'm prepared to be challenged on that, but I think to show respect to our colleagues, uh, Councillor Van Meerbergen was looking to put a motion on the table, and I suggested we want to hear some additional commentary first. Councillor Van Meerbergen, do you wish to articulate uh, where you were going with that, or did I misunderstand? Uh, <clears throat> uh, here we are. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I certainly, as I stated, uh, am prepared to put on uh, an alternative motion um, certainly that um, uh, River Road be open for the 2021 golf season um, and that about a year from now, February 2022, uh, we revisit uh, with the new data that we have uh, collected and some new thinking perhaps, uh, we 
revisit the future of River Road at a future SPPC meeting in February 2022. Sir, seconder for that, I see Councillor Lehman has raised his hand to support. Um, <clears throat> now, colleagues, um, I think uh, you've all indicated, almost all of you have indicated uh, where you stand. We do not want to limit debate, and we will not do that. Having said it, uh, a number of points have already been made. I think we would, uh, for the benefit of all colleagues, like to hear new points, but I see Councillor Hopkins has indicated she would like to talk to this motion. Councillor Pelosa first. Pardon me, Councillor Pelosa, please go ahead. And then Councillor Hopkins is on the motion. So, so um, I guess, Jesus. Um, I also was going to raise a, a point of privilege about what I heard earlier. One comment made, uh, one colleague made a comment of um, to bring our Indigenous youth into the sport. Um, I appreciate wanting to bring more youth into it. Just uh, the Indigenous youth isn't ours. Um, they are their own. We've had enough issues with colonization and other things in our system, as we've also heard the land acknowledgement this morning. Uh, in the spirit of that, just being very mindful about our words, as words do matter. Um, as for keeping River Road open, and specifically speaking to the motion, as I've had had my hand up for some time and hadn't had a chance to talk to the first section first, that's okay. Not interested in keeping River Road open uh, this year, having been reading the reports and everyone's concerns, grateful that we have a new booking system. Um, the city would still have several two courses to run if we close River Road, giving us uh, a selling feature that other single private courses wouldn't have. If you just had one private course, I think that's still a huge selling feature. Recognizing the courses only were at 70% booking capacity. There is still capacity there, which we will work with staff as we've heard getting down um, a new booking system that will be easier and going back to almost normal tea times to allow for spacing at the um, when you check in as the course capacity has not been an issue. Um, having spoken to some residents that if, if golf isn't sustainable, um, other taxpayers who aren't using that facility or golf at all um, and already facing t higher tax hikes won't be interested in paying for it. And the golfers I have spoken to that um, if given the choice of where we're at of the city getting out of golf altogether or what we're gonna do that they, they clearly the ones I spoke to said, let River Road go and keep the other two uh, in the city, that that's the, the jewel of the city and there's such a treasure and uh, of a historic nature that do what we can to financially preserve those two and give those ones the improved golf experience, increased participation and uh, find a way to increase revenues there, which was the mandate of um, the golf task force of what we're trying to do for city services. So with that, uh, I am in, not in favor of the motion on the floor of keeping River Road open for 2021 and talking about this in 2022 and would be in favor of the original staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilor Pelosi, I apologize because uh, I try to watch the screens because we see the yellow hands up. I look at the sidebar and I sometimes see people wave and somehow I missed all three. Thank you for your comments. Councilor Hopkins, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was raising my hand to uh, bring to your attention Councillor Pelosi's hand, but I am willing to go forward with uh, speaking to this um, amendment. And my first question is, I I've heard two comments from my colleagues about increased tax hikes. And I have concerns about that because I know I'm going to get a few emails about hikes uh, that we are contemplating here uh, for Londoners. So my question uh, through you to staff is, I'd like to hear their comments about keeping River Road open for the next year and having this recommendation come back a year later. And also to speak to what, if we do keep it open, what are the increased tax hikes going to look like? Mr. Stafford. Thank you, and through the chair, and I'll, I'll pass that question on to Ms. Burbo. Thank you. Yes, Good, Ms. Thank Burbo. you. 
through the chair. So um, right now we have, uh, of course, through the multi-year budget, we have uh, two years left of our multi-year budget, so 2022 and 2023. Um, offhand, I can recall that our 2022 increase is sitting at 3.9%, and then we have an election year, and we will do the final year of our update of the 2023 budget. So um, certainly there are some challenges that um, our budget is facing. We also have other unforeseen potential challenges that are coming forward with other um, seemingly the health unit that has also come forward potentially with an increase there that is not included in our budget also. So um, we also have a very significant uh, of other challenges with respect to housing and homelessness. So we know that there are great challenges on our budget uh, as it faces right now with our multi-year budget. Um, certainly beyond that, I can't speak to what the increases will, will be. What I can tell you is that nothing in our capital plan or in our both our operating as well as our capital plan has any revenue or um, losses or expenditures for capital built in with respect to golf. So um, the $6 million shortfall that we face with respect to the three um, facilities are simply for the facilities. So that $6 million is just a, a minimum cost to replace the aging needs of our life cycle on the three facilities. It doesn't speak to the this levels of service that could be impacted with respect to the systems that actually improve the golf courses or with anything that would actually improve the clubhouse facilities. So if we, based on the pressing needs, one of the things we would need to do is if the course remains open, we would need to go back and evaluate what the capital needs are and redo projections that uh, would include what our estimates would be for keeping all three courses. And there will need to be tax dollars to support that which will result in a tax increase. I can't tell you how much because that'll depend on what the needs are over the next 10 years and when that work needs to be done. So certainly COVID is, is a bit of an unusual situation that we ran into 2020. 2021 will certainly be a very unusual year as well. But we've tried not to make any knee-jerk reactions for any of our services in terms of impacting the long-term budgets to try to understand what those long-term impacts are going to be so that when we make a change, we know that that'll be a permanent change within the budget and we're not just going up and down. So certainly, I know that if the courses were to remain, we would need to look at the capital needs and there certainly would be tax dollars, but I can't estimate for you how much that would be. Knowing that there's at least $6 million, I mean, you would have to look at when those costs would be needed and you would try to put money into the reserve fund to plan for that thoughtfully over the period of time. So there would be a potential increase, but what that impact would be on the average taxpayer until we would do that uh, capital plan, I would not be able to estimate what that cost would be. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, with this uh, motion uh, that Councillor Van Meerbergen has brought forward, we're just looking at this one year, which would be uh, 2021 and coming back in the beginning of 2022. Again, through you, Mr. Chair, are we anticipating a tax increase by keeping the course open? That's probably a question for Ms. Barbon. Thank you, through the chair. So if you're, so I'm not sure if your question is referring to permanently or whether you're only referring to 2021. So certainly if you're looking at 2021 only, that would be a cost that we would need to build in and we would need to look at additional costs. So certainly 2021, I would expect to be fairly similar to 2022 or 2020 at this point, given you know we don't know exactly what the province will allow us to open and not open. So I think 2020 would be a good estimate for what the cost would be for 2021. Um, if that was the case for 2021, we would need to look at how we're going to fund any additional um, overages the same way we're funding, we're looking at ways to try to mitigate the $20 million um, overall loss in revenue for user fees that we're trying to mitigate. Mm -hmm. So some we go look at user, you know, we were fortunate that in 2020, 
that we were able to receive some significant dollars from the province that resulted in us having a bit of a surplus. However, if we hadn't received provincial support, we would have had an overall deficit for the City of London. So what I, I can't tell you if we have any assurances at all, we've received a small portion of some funding to support us in 2021. But if we do not receive more, we will have a loss that we will need to determine how to manage. Looking at this for the short term, we would add that on to the cost. But for the long term, there would definitely be a tax increase if the course were to remain open to try to look at how we would fund all of the capital program that needs to be done. There, we just simply don't have any other source to fund that, unfortunately, given the, the historic losses that we've seen. It, we, the decision that we looked at to fund this was based on years of patterns that we've seen. It's not any one given year that would make or break or change the prognosis for how we would forecast uh, the long-term cost in the, the long run. Councillor? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Bargon. So really, um, based on your answer, not foreseeing a tax increase for 2021 if we keep River Road open. And I, I just want to be clear with Councillor um, Van Meerbergen's motion that he's bringing that forward to have a revisit of uh, this recommendation in um, 2022 in February. So we would reevaluate, uh, do the comparisons. And uh, I just wanna be very clear here and understand what we're doing. So I appreciate uh, Ms. Barbon, your um, answers. And I am gonna be supporting um, this and I, 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 I heard loud and clear, and I, I've been so interested in everyone's comments because I'm going back and forth, back and forth constantly with this one. And from the onset of this meeting, we heard this is a financial exercise. We also heard that uh, there's key stakeholders in our community that want to keep this open for, for many reasons that I'm not going to repeat. We are looking at just this one year, and I have not been convinced that we have to rush into making a decision, getting rid of a public asset during these times. I'm not convinced that there's a rush to do this immediately. I would be uh, interested in having this conversation in another year, but for now, I will be supporting uh, this motion because I've heard loud and clear the importance of recreational facilities. And I concur with a number of statements that have been made about the philosophy that somehow we all have assumed that golf should pay for golf. I would really like to change that conversation. And uh, I, I, I completely agree with Councillor Turner's comments as well, that uh, by disposing of River Road right now is not gonna fix the problem. We are going to still have um, to solve the problem. And I, for now, am going to be supporting this motion. Thank you. And I do appreciate the um, uh, last two speakers speaking specifically to the motion that's in place. So thank you for that. I have Councillor Lewis. And uh, again, we're asking folks uh, to speak specifically uh, to uh, this motion. And I think we have a pretty good sense from most uh, colleagues where they stand. Councillor Lewis, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And through you, uh, colleagues, I will not be supporting this motion as it is. Uh, if this motion were to say we're going to operate River Road uh, this year to provide uh, some space as what I will call a little bit of a farewell tour for River Road, um, as we pursued uh, opportunities for the sale of the land, including perhaps uh, recruiting somebody to, who's interested or being approached by somebody who's interested in continuing to operate it as a golf facility, that would be different. But all we're doing uh, by deferring it for one year, frankly, colleagues, is setting ourselves up for the same situation the 2010-2011 Council had. You will have one year of very good results that will skew the value of the course. And once we decide to keep it, historic data says the numbers will go back to where they were. So if there was a, a desire from colleagues to say, you know, we're gonna operate it this year, but we're gonna operate it while we're preparing to sell it. Uh, and 
uh, transfer ownership if we find a buyer uh, at the end of the golf season. Uh, that I would be more supportive of. Uh, but just kicking this down the uh, road by a year and then saying we're going to use the 2021 data to justify what we do with it afterwards, um, one year's data is not going to change uh, a, what's almost a 30-year history of this course uh, in terms of its usage. So uh, I won't support one year. Um, there are some other options that I might be open to, but not uh, this one as it is. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a, a question for Mr. Stafford. Um, the the costs of operating the golf courses during COVID, the operating costs, additional PPE, additional sanitization, limiting people in the golf carts, all of those things. How 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 much did those costs increase the regular operating costs? Mr. Stafford. Yeah, thank you. Through the chair, uh, basic costs were uh, at some of the courses we had uh, greeters at the the parking lot to uh, to establish the the proper flow. We had greeters at the uh, at the entrance to the pro shop, and we had uh, those longer tee times, and we had those uh, uh, single riders in the golf carts. Now we've been able to alleviate some of those as I've talked about. So we've been able to alleviate uh, the tee time differences and. We've been able to alleviate some of the card issues, although we do expect that that some clients would would still prefer to be a, a single riders because of the precautions, and and we would respect that. Um, so it's uh, it's an increase. Uh, that being said, there's some decreases in uh, in costs as far as food and beverage because we haven't been able to offer the same offerings uh, there and, and tournaments. So there's uh, it, it's a real balance and a and a mix mixed bag there so there's some some lower revenues and there's some lower staff costs as well uh, but certainly at a at a model that was uh, lean as we could at, at river road it would increase the cost through a, a greeter and uh, some of the uh, covid precautions from cleaning that we would have to do so I, i'm sorry i don't have an exact number there there are many layers to that but uh, there would be some increased costs from the, the greeter and the cleaning Councillor Cassidy, we're good thank you i appreciate that so I agree with Councillor Lewis kicking this down. This has been kicked down the road since 2010. This isn't new. This isn't a rush. This is something that every council has talked about for the, this is the third council to talk about this issue. This, uh, this course has never contributed to the reserve fund. Never. It's always taken from the reserve fund. And so if we, it was some of the letters that we received talked about the, the bad condition that they feel our golf faci facilities are in. M many of the, the, the people that wrote to us said, not only keep River Road open, but you need to do better. You need to do better on all your courses. The buildings are run down. You need to do better with the greens. You need to make all of these improvements. We can't make those improvements when our reserve fund is constantly being drained to keep River Road open. And yes, selling River Road, even at the optimal price that we hope to get for this property, will not make that $6 million deficit go away, but it will allow us to begin building up that reserve fund again. If we are going to make the best golf experience through our golf facilities that we possibly can, we need to have the funds to do that. And right now, whether you agree with the philosophy that's been in place since the 1920s or not, right now we have no item in our multi-year budget to, it, to attack this infrastructure gap that exists in our golf facilities. This is the way the system is set up right now. Perhaps in some future time, there will be an adjustment made but right now, this is the system that's been set up that and if we kick this down the can down the road one more year, our existing golf facilities will continue to deteriorate because we are not addressing the issues. We are not addressing the shortfall and we should not delay this. This is this is not a rush decision. It's been 11 years or 10 or 11 years in the making. 
and the staff recommendation has never changed in 11 years. Thank you. Colleagues, what we have is a very clear question set out by Councillor Van Meerberg and seconded by Councillor Lehman. I point out as well that uh, we have included, as we had with the original staff recommendation, receipt of the various communications uh, uh, from the public as part of that motion. Um, I wonder, colleagues, are, are we good to uh, put this to a vote on this clear question? Councillor Van Holst. You're on mute, Councillor Van Holst. Thank you. Uh, so I'm certainly going to support the motion, but uh, and some of the reasons are why. So I, we're talking about solving a golf challenge that won't be uh, solved if we sell this, but I certainly think we've got a better chance of solving it uh, with an extra 18 holes than we do with 18 holes fewer. And so uh, I, I think giving it a year to actually take on the problem, because in that in that length of time that Councillor Cassidy was talking about, we haven't really we haven't really done something that's addressing the problem. So now we need to do something this year to address that problem. See what we can do. Maybe that's maybe we need a big big fee hike this year, which is which will match the ones we're expecting in other places. All right. If uh, I don't know how much of a hike we can have, but um, it would seem if we need seven hundred thousand uh, dollars more a year, and we have one hundred eleven thousand rounds of golf, then uh, then you know, maybe seven dollars would 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 cover that. Maybe we don't we don't need to cover all of that, or maybe that's fine. So I think we can start. I think what we want to do is spend this year thinking about what's going to make the difference. And we may be in the situation where losing River Road uh, loses us a lot of our, our, our memberships because they're going to go to another club that now has an extra 18 holes in it and uh, provides uh, more chances of getting tea times. So I think there's, there's a danger, there is a danger in us uh, divesting of this resource, even, even though there may be an opportunity, but I think we should experiment with it a little bit. And uh, we need to be, you know, we need to be creative. Uh, the, I would say that I read an article by John Taffer on golf. This is the guy who did the series uh, Bar Rescue. And uh, he said that, that the future of golf isn't on just on the greens, it's, it's in the experience. It's creating experience that wants to get people out there and get new people out there. That's, that's, where, that's where the experience is. So we need, to, we need to be doing something different. And there are groups that love golf and want to want to have a chance to uh, to participate in running this to try out some new ideas. And they've got new ideas. And whether we let them do them or we try and accept those uh, ideas and implement them ourselves, uh, there are things that can be done at River Road that can bring more people there and turn turn this deficit around and give us a better chance. Of uh, because once River Road is making a profit, then it is contributing to that uh, to that uh, that golf reserve fund, and that's where we want to get to. I mean, that's the ultimate thing: is that every course makes money. Now, in the real world, they do, and we want to see that happen as well. So, I hope you'll give it another year so we can so we can try some some of these exciting things. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Morgan, Deputy Mayor Morgan. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, because this is committee and this is now the motion on the floor, I, I did, I did want to provide some um, thoughts on this. And I wanted to start by saying uh, this is one of those debates where, uh, you know, colleagues get pegged in a certain way. I know Councillor Squire always gets frustrated by this. You voted this way, thus you believe. And, I, well, you know, what I hear today is two very different, but but two, two different perspectives on how to support golf, how to support the city's golf asset. One is let's keep River Road open. Let's see if we can turn it into a profit generating machine and let's try to tackle some of the capital problems we have. The other is 
let's dispose of that particular piece of the asset to strengthen the other components of it. But but I haven't heard any councillors say they're not interested in trying to strengthen the asset as a whole. Uh, we just have different perspectives on how to do that. I will say, I, I do join the colleagues in saying that I, I do not think another year of data is going to make much of a difference. And I also do not think that this is going to be a, a course that is going to turn a profit anytime soon. It, it has proven year after year after year that it that it's not capable of doing that and you know that that is problematic and and you know in it said the motion actually says to assess this in a post-covid environment well i can tell you that 2021 is not going to be a post-covid environment anytime soon um particularly not during the start of the gulf season and and even you know halfway through it it's going to be a challenging year to operate you know these types of facilities no matter what and we're at a disadvantage based on you know other private market providers who can who can access things like the federal wage subsidy programs that existed in 2021 and continue to exist, which which municipalities are excluded from accessing. So we operate at, at a significant disadvantage. And so the fact that we were able to perform the other two courses as well as we did during 2020, I think is a testament to the work our staff have done with the conditions that we've set. So I, I, I lean towards the let's make the capital injection sooner rather than later into the Gulf assets. I like the staff recommendation. Uh, I think we need to shore this up. And one thing Councillor Van Hole said kind of struck me, and that is, you know, if we sell off this asset, someone else is going to be able to use it and pick it up and people will go there. Well, guess what? That, that's okay. You know, the municipal government does not need to be operating Gulf assets when the private sector can. And I think it can, it can, it can supply some of that, you know, public benefit uh, with the other two courses that it doesn't need all three to do. So the fact that there is a market out there um, to provide this type of service means, you know, the level that we operate within it, as Councillor Turner said, I think is an important, is an important one. I certainly support our Gulf assets, but I, I support strengthening them and shoring them up for the foreseeable future. And, and, and even selling off one still means we have a ways to go, as is meant. So thank you. Colleagues, I would thank you. I wonder if you're comfortable with us proceeding with the vote on the clear question. Councillor Cassidy. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to clarify, you, you had said something about the uh, adding in the receipt, receipt part and all of that, but I wonder if you could separate them out because we don't, I don't know how this vote's going to go, so we don't want receiving the report to fail. I, I think we don't want that anyway. Yep. I think, I think colleagues, if we look at uh, at the proposal as put forward by Councillor Van Meerberg and seconded by mm -hmm. Councillor Lehman, and if you refresh your screen, you're going to find that you're down at, at screen four. I don't know if you're there, Councillor Cassidy, but you'll see there is an A and a B plus receiving communications. And it says uh, A, well, perhaps I could ask the clerks just to read A and B just so it's, it's crystal clear and Perhaps the public will then also get a sense what it is we're voting for, but you don't need to read all of the names of the communications received. Please go ahead. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, the motion reads as follows, that the following actions be taken with respect to River Road Golf Course. Part A, the Civic Administration be directed to proceed with the operation of River Road Golf Course for the 2021 season in order to evaluate the municipal golf operation more, operations more holistically in a post-COVID environment. And part B, the civic administration be directed to bring back the matter of municipal golf operations to a future meeting of the Strategic Priorities and Policy Committee, not before February, 2022, with additional information and data with respect to operations. If this, through the chair, if this motion were to fail, you're at committee so you can put any motion on the floor for a subsequent vote. So with that, colleagues, are we clear on what uh, we're voting on here? I'll be asking the clerk to bring that uh, forward. I see Councillor Hopkins. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. And maybe uh, through you to the mover, uh, when it comes to be, uh, I wonder if we can make a slight amendment because I would like to support this, uh, that um, when the report comes back to SVPC that we exclude not before February, uh, that I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, uh, that it can come back uh, to SVPC in the new year or 
I, I, I don't want it to be specific that we can't have this conversation until February 2022. And that's my question to the mover and the seconder, if they can allow um, a slight amendment without putting words in their mouths, I, I, I would uh, ask that um, they take out the words, not before. Councillor Van Meerbergen, are you comfortable with that? So if I'm, if I'm hearing this correctly, basically it's uh, take out the phrase not before, but it would still say February 2022. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine with me. I thought I heard, uh, forgive me, Councillor Hopkins, I thought I heard you say to eliminate the words not before February 2022. Is that correct? Yeah, it's pretty hard. I can't see the motion. So I'm just going by what the clerk said and uh, just did not... Um, uh, I, I don't think we should box ourselves into having this discussion even earlier be, uh, to February 2022. I just want a little bit more flexibility. I think to give uh, Councillor Van Meerberg and to give you some comfort, at all, the rest of that line in that paragraph that you've prepared says that uh, 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 additional information and data with respect to the operations in 2021. So that will presume that 2021 is complete, all the operations. Uh, so just so that you're aware. Councillor Van Meerberg, you have a comment. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, what if we were to use the uh, phrase no later than February 2022. We just add that and just separate. Then that leaves it. It's got some leeway. Okay. I see a That's thumb fine. from Councillor Hopkins, but I need to see a thumb from, and I see a thumb from Councillor Lehman. A lot of thumbs going up here for that purpose of that. I'll ask the clerk just to make the appropriate revision. And just to read that particular B, just so that it's crystal clear to the public, but the, more uh, to the point to council colleagues. So B, if you will, please. Thank you. With the revision to part B, it's the civic administration be directed to bring back the matter of municipal golf operations to a future meeting of the strategic priorities and policy committee no later than February 2022 with additional information and data with respect to the operations in 2021. And if you refresh your e-scribe, you should be able to see that motion. Well, that's looks like that's what it says. So with that in mind, uh, colleagues, are you comfortable with this calling the question? I'm seeing no objections. Uh, clerk will ask you to put that forward as you're able, please. Councillor Turner, you may wish to refresh your screen. That will, I think, get you to where you need to be. Sorry, Your Worship, I couldn't get to the buttons. The clerk made a point of saying, uh, uh, Councillor Turner, it's not about you. Just, it's all, it's all good. Closing the vote, the motion is lost five to nine. So I wonder colleagues with that vote, I wonder if there's uh, some interest. I thought I heard some discussion from one of our colleagues about putting the original staff recommendation on the floor. We can do with that issue, please. I, that was Councillor Pelosa seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Uh, new comments, new questions, uh, anything that uh, colleagues would like to uh, bring to this motion. Councillor Van Holst. Sorry, I thought Councillor Hopkins, uh, I missed you first. Uh, Councillor Van Holst, sorry with you, you'll be second. Councillor Hopkins, go ahead. You're on mute if you wish to speak, Councillor Hopkins. Did I see your hand up? 
Councillor Hopkins. Hello. It doesn't appear that Councillor Hopkins can hear me. I don't want her to lose any part of the debate. Just bear with us a moment. And Councillor Pelosa, I'm going to apologize to you. Were you looking to speak to this as well? I, I noted that you had moved the motion, but. Colleagues, can you hear this now? Okay, I see some yeses. Now, I know that Councillor Pelosi had moved this motion, but I thought, Councillor Hopkins, were you looking to speak to it? Then I misinterpreted and misunderstood. Councillor Pelosi, did you have your hand up to speak to it beyond? Then I do have Councillor Van Holst then. So I'll get you second then, Councillor Hopkins, because I'm going to recognize Councillor Van Holst first, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. And just through you, it seems in uh, my uh, previous comments, I uh, might have uh, uh, caused some offense. And so I wanted to offer an apology where, of course, in this COVID, I'm constantly thinking of the context of we're all in this together, together and thinking of we and us and our, and um, I certainly uh, didn't intend to uh, offend anyone in, in my comments. Thank you. So noted, thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Hopkins, you're back. Uh, thank you, Chair. Are, are we speaking to the main motion now? Sorry, I yes, just got a yes, bit yes, we are. Uh, it's been moved and seconded the staff recommendation, main motion. So that's what we're speaking to now. I wonder if you can. Um, I, I am not supportive of A and B. Uh, as I explained, I uh, do not think right now is the time to make decisions, uh, and. Um, you know, uh, I, I just really don't see the rush. I, I know it's been mentioned a number of times that we've been talking about this uh, for many years, but uh, we also, um, things have changed. We used to lease River Road. And I have heard loud and clear from, from the community that uh, they want to keep the um, River Road golf course public. And I think that now's the time not to make these decisions and unload our assets. I hear loud and clear that we are, we need that capital injection to support our other golf courses, but there are other opportunities. Uh, if you reviewed a number of those letters, there is a, a lot of support from Londoners to increase our fees to have a different business plan. We are an aging population. We are uh, looking at a greater population and providing recreational facilities as a municipality is, uh, it, and keeping it public is something that I support and I've heard loud and clear that Londoners also support. So I would like uh, A and uh, maybe A and B together is fine, but uh, removing C because uh, if we are going to sell and it looks like that we may be going that way, at least it should go back to the Municipal Golf Reserve Fund. So noted, I've spoken with the clerk with regard to that and uh, we would be putting A and, unless there's an objection, A and B together and then voting on that and voting on C separately. Councillor Van Merbergen. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I won't, obviously won't be supporting this uh, this motion. Uh, and with the greatest respect to my colleagues that spoke earlier, uh, the purpose of giving ourselves the year was simply to uh, not kick the can down the road, but to provide Londoners some relief in the middle of a pandemic. And that's why this is the worst time to shut this course down, uh, in this case, forever. Um, I, I think, as, as I stated earlier, the benefits far outweigh any downside for a short period of time that we were talking about. Um, to close it for good in the middle of a pandemic foregoes any of the benefits that we would look for. We saw last year in the golf season um, how booked up they were. That was the complaint after complaint after complaint. You could not get proper tee times. 
um, it, 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 it could have been alleviated if that course was open. Uh, it wasn't. We had a chance to do it this year and we chose not to again. Um, I do believe that, and I think some of us on this council share that belief, that we are in the middle of a fundamental reset uh, because of what's happened with, with COVID in terms of many of our behaviors, uh, at, certainly as a community. I think we've got a real premium now on outdoor recreation and golf is uh, certainly a major component of that. So again, I won't be uh, uh, supportive of this. I'm thankful that uh, Councillor Hopkins has gone with A and B, uh, and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you. Is the uh, are, are the motions uh, combining uh, staff recommendations A and B together, and then C sufficiently clear? Or are there any other comments? Seeing none, I'd like to put uh, A and B to the vote, if I could, please. Closing the vote, the motion's passed nine to five with one recused. Thank you, colleagues. And I'll turn your attention to item C uh, on the staff recommendation. And I'll ask the clerk to put that to a vote. Councillor Helmer. Closing the vote, the motion's passed 13 to one with one recused. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Stafford, uh, Ms. Barbone and uh, Mr. McGonagall and all who have had a hand in working this through. Okay, I thought we had included all the communications in uh, with that last motion. Uh, we have not. So look for a motion uh, to receive those communications moved by Councillor Lewis, seconded by Councillor Lehman. Um, any discussion? Then we will call the question very shortly.
Councillor Peloza, Councillor Van Meerbergen. Sorry, uh, Peloza will vote yes. I'm just having issues scrolling down to the buttons. Closing the vote, the motion's passed 15 to zero. My uh, thanks to uh, stands. Colleagues, now I'll turn your attention to items for direction 4.1, which is the consideration of appointment to the RBC Place London Board. I'll uh, note that uh, the board has brought forward a nominee for our consideration, Mr. Garrett Vanderwist. Uh, this would be a reappointment for a two year term beginning Feb 1, 2021 to November 30, 2022. Is there a mover for this motion, Councillor Lehman? Seconded by Councillor Van Meerbergen. Comments, questions? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. Closing the vote and the motion's passed 15 to zero. So colleagues, there are no deferred matters nor additional business. Under confidential, we have one report. I'll ask the clerk just to uh, advise uh, the public accordingly. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, the matter is a matter pertaining to personal matters about identifiable individuals, labor relations or employee negotiations, including communications necessary for that purpose, and advice and recommendation of officers and employees of the corporation, including communications necessary for that purpose, and for the purpose of providing instructions and direction to officers and employees of the corporation. Before luck for a mover and seconder to go into closed session, i just ask you to think for a few moments if we need a few minute break before we uh, go back into uh, closed session or do we, what's the pleasure of the, what's the, I'd like just to open this up uh, just very briefly. What's the pleasure of our uh, of colleagues? Do you want a few minutes? Councillor Turner, do you have a comment? A few minutes break would be good. That would put us to about seven o'clock if that's acceptable to staff and colleagues okay great so if that with that uh, in mind and seeing no other view i'll look for a mover to go into closed session councillor hopkins second by councillor pelosa uh, we'll call that question Closing the vote, the motion's passed 15 to zero.